That's most definitely what's up. Death to all of them. That's most definitely what's up. Chess Club. Sixteen times the detail. Assassins, Creed Valaha. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome. How's everybody doing? You feeling good? On a Friday? The day of our Lord, Todd Howard. 16 times the detail. You're damn right, Todd. Sure does have that much detail. Praise be to Todd. Hi, everyone. Hopefully you are rocking and rolling today. Uh, <laughs> it's the voice of a 500k YouTuber. Congrats on that. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Yeah, no, all day, whatever day that was, uh, Wednesday, I guess, I was just refreshing because I was like, oh man, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And it did. It, it did. It's weird. It's weird, but we did it. 
Thank you all. Type is now a member. Congrats on the sub milestone, man. Clapping hands. Much deserved. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you. Yeah. No, and we're going to have like a big celebration probably like June. It's kind of up in the air, but it might be June, might be May for this channel because this channel is on its way to 100,000, which is madness. Uh, but that's probably happening in the next like 90 days for sure, probably within the next 60. So I don't know if you guys have any recommendations or thoughts on something fun we could do to celebrate 100,000 on this channel we could do that uh, some people are like oh just do a, like a 24-hour stream or like a subathon kind of thing i don't know if that's like that much fun for the viewer though it's like yeah thank you to the community give me money you know like i don't know how that's that fun for the viewer but i do think if we were to do something really wacky or different that could be fun i don't know um yeah thank you everybody isaac rock Nocturnal, Mendez, Luke, another Luke, oh baby. Um, Dovi, all of you guys. Appreciate you guys. Um, last day of a two week notice, and I'm definitely watching this stream while it works. <laughs> That's awesome, Jake. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah, tight. 16 months. That's crazy, my friend. Thank you. That's madness. That's crazy. Can we bring somebody from Ubisoft to chat? I don't know if they'd be allowed to. Like, I know people who work at Ubisoft who are delightful and would be super fun, but I don't know if they'd be allowed to talk. Like, I, about anything anybody would, like, want to ask them about, you know? Like, they could talk about their favorite foods, but I don't think they could talk about much of anything else, you know? UFC 300, I've been in the dark with it. I know it's happening, but I, I've not kept up with it. Because whenever there's a big event like this, there's always a last minute change. Somebody gets caught, uh, like popping Tyrannoball or something. So I, I don't know. I'm just burned from UFC 200 when all that crap went down with John Jones, because he was supposed to fight Daniel Cormier. I think it was 200, maybe it was 204 or 205. Um, cause 200 also had Brock Lesnar and that whole thing was a, a disaster cause he also like popped for a ton of drugs and everything. And you like, you look at Brock Lesnar and you're like, yeah, I could have probably told you that, but what's funny. So Brock Lesnar, yeah, look at this guy, look at this guy made of nothing but meat. Jesus, dude. He's like six foot five or something like he's he's just a monster they had to specially produce his gloves they had to do like i think it was like five xl gloves because the regular ones didn't fit him because he has lunch boxes for fists it's crazy it's crazy what's funny though his daughter actually goes to colorado Colorado State University, which is where I graduated from. So she's actually a wrestler at my alma mater, which is crazy. She's also a monster, just a beast. Like, Jesus. <laughs> like, like, God. So, fun little fact. Fun fact. Oh, also, I just thought this was funny. This came across my timeline. <laughs> and I thought I'd share it before we get into to good stuff. Because it's just really funny. This guy is just like filming a documentary on the streets of New York City. And just see if you can spot anybody in the background, okay? Just see if you spot anybody. Right, And they use something they call pyroprocessing. The interesting thing is they call it pyroprocessing, mm. but it's a molten salt process. They're dissolving this thing in a molten salt and they're doing electrochemistry on it. Why don't they call it molten salt? They Dude just casually walked by George Lucas uh, <laughs> while walking through the city. <laughs> and George Lucas, yeah, I've always wondered if like this happens to celebrities, if they ever get spotted, they're like, somebody's going to tell him in the future. Somebody's going to notice. And tell him I did have somebody reach out to me once and they're like hey my friend took a snapchat 
at, I think it was when we were like in Orlando at Universal Studios, but they were taking pictures and selfies and stuff. And they took a selfie and they're like, I was looking at my friend's timeline and I swear to God, it's you in the background. Were you at Universal Studios like last week or whatever it was? Sure enough, I was. So I accidentally photobombed somebody and then one of their random fans or friends uh, recognized it, which I thought was kind of funny. So, so like stuff like that does happen occasionally, which is just kind of fun. Um, it makes me wonder if I've ever walked past or been around like super famous people without realizing it. You know, one time I was driving on I-25, which is our like north south highway here in Colorado, the big one. And um, let's see, I came across where is it? I came across a, a car that was so unique. I was like, that's got to be from from somebody, right? It was a bright pink Rolls Royce SUV. Okay. Just like this, just like this. And like, this is a, I don't know how much, like three, four, five hundred thousand dollar car and it's just casually driving on the highway i was like that you don't you don't see that every day you know that's a very unique kind of car and then i realized thank you for the super job i'll get to it in just a second um and then i realized oh wait jeffrey star just moved at this time he had just moved to wyoming and this was like 15 minutes from the border of wyoming so i was like i bet that that could very well be Jeffree Star, because who on earth would be driving this? And then I pulled up Instagram, and sure enough, like Jeffree Star had just like had posted all these pictures driving this gigantic, bright pink Rolls Royce. And so I saw Jeffree Star driving this car, um, you know. And we pulled up and around, and uh, sure enough, like. Jeffree Star is a very unique looking person. And so when you see Jeffree Star, there's little doubt it's Jeffree Star. So like, what are the odds I see somebody that looks just like this? Wasn't wearing a bright pink wig or anything, but I see somebody like this that's driving a pink Rolls Royce near where they just moved to. I'm pretty sure it was them. I'm I'm pretty sure it was, it was Jeffree Star. Pretty sure. I honestly don't know why you'd spend that much money on a car. Like, no judgment. If you're super rich and you can do that, more power to you. But, well, Rolls Royce, I guess, is actually usable. But, like, one time I was driving through Old Town Fort Collins, uh, where I went to, to college, and there was a guy driving a Bugatti. And this guy driving the Bugatti, like, he had to go and do, like, a 15-point turn to get up into a gas station because it had, like, a, a dip in the gutter. And it's like, the dude can't even drive around town you know it's just tough you know i i just i don't know i was at the mgm the night tupac died huge crowd got rowdy found out later that it was him and his entourage jumping a dude oh jesus <laughs> that's crazy what color is you bugatti i i wish uh, like a bugatti well i don't wish i'd rather spend that money on something else um a bugatti i don't think i do a rolls royce just seems like a really nice car so i i could see doing that but like a lambo it's like oh it goes really fast and can peak at like 200 something miles an hour I'm like that's awesome but why like what use would i have for that and especially in colorado where it's snowy and icy all the time i wouldn't want to ever drive it <laughs> like i wouldn't trust myself you know i just wouldn't want to do it is that patrick star's brother yeah yeah. Um, let's see. Real quick. Harvey's hamburgers. Thank you for the super chat. You hear OJ Simpson passed. Man, he'll be looking up at us this stream. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I did hear uh, that OJ or Infall jo James Simpson died. That whole thing is is crazy. I am of the mind. The, the way I heard one of the lawyers put it that worked on the case was that both juries got it correct because he was charged initially for murder, acquitted, because largely they had to dismiss a lot of the evidence because um, Mark or Mike, I think Mark, 
Furman was one of the detectives and he was like a pretty hardcore racist, casually dropping the N-word all the time. It's pretty bad and he was caught on recordings. And so it was really tough for the jury to uh, assume that he was being above board when he found all this evidence and broke protocols and stuff. So they dismissed a lot of evidence, even though the evidence was pretty overwhelming that OJ did it. Um, but then there was another civil trial that was brought against him by the family of uh, Goldman. And OJ was found liable for their deaths in that trial. And I, I think both trials got it right. Like I think probably by the rules of our system, probably should have been found not guilty because they broke so many rules in the original trial and the prosecution was terrible and just so many problems. But I also think he definitely did it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, if you've never seen the cover of his book, this guy, man. MR Celio kill underscore 54 donated $5. Like, look at this. Super chat. Hey, what's your thoughts on the pricing points on Star Wars Outlaws? Happy Friday, Luke smiley face. Oh yeah, no, thank you, my friend. Well, I'll I'll go through these like in order, otherwise I'll lose my I'll lose my train of thought. Um, but thank you. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Um But uh yeah, I mean look at this. This is a book he wrote. And you see there's an if in there. But if you look at this, you sure don't see the if, do you? <laughs> like the balls of someone to, in my opinion, allegedly kill two people and then write a book if I did it confessions of the killer like unbelievable unbelievable like again anybody else does this you'd be like what a monster yeah in OJ Simpson's own words it's as if Simpson is sitting across from the reader, laying out his side of the story one-on-one, -on -one, no reporters or gossip columnists or court TV vultures sticking in their beaks. A confession, judge for yourself. My feeling, you bet it is. The case is now officially closed. This appalling but mesmerizing book does it. So in, in 2007, as they outline here, federal ju court judge A.J. Crystal awarded the Goldman family the rights to If I Did It, thus began one of the strangest odysseys in publishing history. Basically, the family of um of the one of the victims um mr mr goldman he or his family gets all the proceeds for it which is why it's called the authorized version uh but it's just madness but this like shoe print the bloody footprint was one of the reasons he was found guilty in the civil trial and that was just because he um was found to be wearing a very particular type of shoe that matched the bloody footprint and they didn't have pictures of him wearing the shoes in the original trial but they did have pictures of him wearing those shoes that were brought in the civil trial um so i think almost certainly he did it yeah you can kind of see here bloody footprint comparison so like very unique shoe pattern and they eventually did find the the actual footprints um or the actual shoes that did that um but they didn't have the pictures of him wearing the shoes in the original trial but yeah yeah here's him wearing the actual shoes <laughs> so like they found him wearing the shoes that were used in the murder <laughs> and like there's just so many things you're, you're looking at where it's like okay this is getting really hard to like <laughs> argue against so i i think Honestly, I, I think he did it. Um, and if he didn't do it, how insane do you have to be to go and write a book basically admitting you did it? You know? Like, how does that make any sense? <laughs> it's crazy, dude. Yeah, Casey Anthony, my, my take on Casey Anthony is that I think she, um, the the it's not an original take, to be fair. But her, she said her nanny was named Zanny. Zanny the nanny was her nickname. She said her name was Nida, but uh, that lady didn't exist. She she made her up. But Zanny, I think, was actually a kind of tongue-in-cheek nickname for her actual nanny, which was Xanax. So I think she drugged her 
kid whenever she wanted to go out partying and one day she overdid it and the kid overdosed basically and then she panicked and freaked out so I'm, I'm pretty sure she did it but also like I, I understand how that was like a circumstantial case and everything but I still think that <laughs> it was clear she did it even though it wasn't clear exactly what happened it was still clear she was involved like come on yeah anyway but yeah the OJ Simpson thing it's it's crazy I was playing games with my brother last night Jacob and Jacob just casually mentions yeah it's crazy about OJ Simpson right I'm like yeah he just died kind of out of nowhere he's like yep murdered by his own butthole <laughs> I was like Jesus because he died of prostate cancer apparently <laughs> it's like what a way to put it oh man yeah yeah, he's one of the unluckiest men alive if he didn't do it and his whole image was tarnished like this. Yeah. Either he is the world's most unlucky human being and also kind of a jerk for kind of leaning into it and pretending he did do it. Or he did it. Harvey's hamburgers donated 10 Canadian dollars through Super yeah. Chat. I burst out laughing cause he said at one point he was afraid to go to LA cause he knows that the guy is still. I just picture him, hand on the mirror. Who could have done this with a tear in his eye? Yeah, no, I, I think that's fair. I mean, for a while, I think he was kind of pretending he didn't do it and trying to rebuild a career or whatever. And once he realized that there was no way of rebuilding this, like you're you're just done. Uh, that nobody's ever going to cast you in a movie. No one's ever going to like forget about this. Once he realized that was the case, he just started leaning into it. So, <clears throat> yeah. Um, real quick, thank you also, Taser for subbing with Prime over on Twitch. Appreciate you, my friend. And also, uh, oops, I'm very behind on chat. There we go. Um, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, we can get to that. Uh, yeah, the Star Wars Outlaws thing. Let me pull that up here in a second. Um, can you show me the contraption for the second keyboard you told me to remind you during the stream? Oh, yes, Handler. I mentioned this. I think I actually moved it. Um, yes. I have these things. You're asking me, like, how I keep my keyboards lifted. Right now, I only have one keyboard just because I was moving things around, and I do that. But they're just, like, little cardboard braces that went on the corner, like, edge of a box, I think for our lawnmower. And so I just went in there and it, it was a long piece of cardboard, but it was really firm. So I just cut it into these smaller pieces and then I wrapped it in electrical tape so that it wouldn't flatten out when weight was on it. And then I just set them like this and then the keyboard sits on top. Like very, very easy. It, for me, it was free because I already had the tape and the cardboard. Uh, normally I would just throw the cardboard away but it worked far better than any of the like expensive keyboard stands that i was finding online you know it just worked easier long and firm you're damn right is there any other way you know um yeah thank you for the 500 congrats on the 500 yeah thank you thank you thank you the juice has dried up in fact the juice is no longer loose true um do, 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 do. let me see uh and mr steal you kill thank you for the five what's your thoughts on the pricing points for star wars outlaws happy friday luke um i'm i again i'm just kind of surprised that everybody's acting like this is some huge revelation like i saw one guy who was like ubisoft has overstepped once again i'm like bro look back at the pricing for like Ubisoft games in 2016 like they, they've been pricing games like this for ages <laughs> like I'm just surprised that everybody's acting like they just realized this is going on I'm like this has been a thing for a while I don't know what it is but it seems like you know and to be clear that doesn't mean that that's okay I'm just saying like to to phrase everything and frame it all as this time they've overstepped I'm like bro where were you like six years ago, seven years ago, <laughs> you know, it was just funny that like, we're just now realizing all of this. It's, it was just stupid. Um, 
because this has been going on for ages. It's the same exact thing that happened with Dragon's Dogma 2, where it's like everybody's freaking out over the DLC day one and uh, being in a single player game. And um, it was like last year, like literal months ago with Resident Evil 4 Remake, they also sold like gameplay altering things in the, the game day one but like nobody brought it up or cared about it. It's just weird. For whatever reason this year, people are just like all of a sudden realizing what's been kind of a mainstay in the, the industry for a decade. And it's just kind of weird that it's all, it's like everybody's just now waking up to it. You know, I don't, I, I don't know what to make of it. I, I don't know if it's a couple of YouTubers or streamers that are just now waking up to it and realizing it or, or what and so their communities are just realizing it um but i just think people are sick and tired of it at, at this point yeah and i get that um I, I think it's it also fits with the broader narrative that companies are just getting more desperate and more greedy even though they've been doing this for ages so they're not getting more i think they've always been greedy <laughs> and like desperate for higher revenues and things but like, it's nothing new, you know? No, specifically what I'm saying, Zach, is the people that are framing this as Ubisoft has now stepped over the line or Capcom has now stepped over the line or Take-Two has now crossed the line. It's like, bro, they crossed the line eight years ago, nine years ago. Why are we just now bringing it up, you know? And that's why like the Dragon's Dogma 2 devs were by all accounts, pretty surprised at the, the backlash over the DLC because they were like, uh, Capcom games have been doing this for ages. Like, why, why are we just now getting upset? So I, I just think it's, it's funny that people are just now like acting like it's a new thing, you know? Um, as for the, the pricing of Star Wars Outlaws, like my stance is, and probably will always be don't pre-order things. You don't need to buy anything until you've seen reviews and heard what it actually is like. The premium editions mostly are sold based off of having a season pass built in and early access. Don't pay for the early access and don't uh, buy the season pass until you know the season pass is going to be worth it. Like, it's really just not that complicated. Like, those higher editions are just built to appeal to hardcore fanboys that are going to pay whatever amount of money. Like, they're going to buy the highest end version of the game that they possibly can. Um, but a reasonable level-headed person just shouldn't buy it. And this hasn't changed. Like, this is nothing new. For the Star Wars Outlaws, yeah, don't buy the, the 130 dollar version you know J don't <laughs> it's it's really just not that complicated it's just funny um let's see harvey thank you for that let's see uh dude the price of nhl 24 on ps5 is like 150 dollars canadian ubisoft has been doing their multi-option pre-orders for years this is nothing new yeah, it's, I don't know if it's that there are certain communities that haven't realized it and this is genuinely new to them. And so they, they're very surprised by it. I don't know if that's it or if it's just, I, I don't know if it's, it's not even like selective outrage. With Dragon's Dogma 2, I think it was selective outrage because those same people were not calling for boycotts of Resident Evil 4 that did the exact same thing from the same publisher. And so I was like, okay, if we're going to be inconsistent about it, then I don't know how seriously to take the, the claims, you know? Luke, video idea, Todd Howard interview. You have to interview him. It would be awesome to interview him. But as far as I know, like he only really inter or gets interviewed by more established like media outlets or like old school media guys that he's known for ages back in the days of like fallout 4 i remember hearing stories of like smaller youtubers that went to e3 and just would meet him and casually chat with him i don't think he does that anymore 
not just because E3 is dead, but I, I just, I don't think he makes himself that accessible anymore. Which to be clear, I kind of get, because I think he'd get accosted a lot more now, but. Lex Friedman, yeah, I think a lot of those guys that go on Lex Friedman are because they listen to Lex Friedman. Like, I, I think that he's just a fan of the show. Uh, and so he's like, yeah, I'll go on, why not? So. Uh, yeah, no, buddy. I've been watching. I've been watching been that. Yeah. Thoughts on Manor Lords, City Builder solo dev project coming out in two weeks. Yeah. No, I've, I've been keeping an eye on it. It's on all my uh, my notifications and stuff. So I've been watching it. I'm very intrigued. I played the demo when they dropped that, however long ago that was. But yeah, I think it looks really cool. And also, by the way, Jesus, 35 months on Twitch. That's madness we're almost at three years that's crazy Vinny dude. diaz donated four dollars and 99 cents through super chat if you're gonna buy the dlc you mighty as well buy it early and get the expensive eve version but i also understand 130 dollars is 130 dollars yeah Vinny. i think for me or my my point is just that right now as of today we don't know if that dlc is going to be worth the extra, you know, 40 bucks or 50 bucks for the season pass. We don't know if the game is even going to be worth 70. You know, it could be that it's a buggy broken mess and it's not worth 70. It could be that it's only five hours long and it's super repetitive and it's like, oh, this is worth 30 bucks or 10 bucks or whatever. It's not worth that. Um, so for me, there's just too many question marks. And especially like we just had skull and bones which was a full price 70 dollar game which was just like ridiculously lacking in variety and i don't think it was worth 70 bucks i think it should have been free to play if anything so that makes me think that okay maybe the value propositions from ubisoft are not super consistent you know it might be worth 70 it might not be worth 70 at all so for me, I'm just like, let's just wait, <laughs> you know, it hasn't changed since they did it last time on a big game and it's not changing today. Just wait. Let's Potential just Beauty money, Ruined you know? donated $4.99 through Super Chat. Thank you. Hi, Luke. Did you see the Warhorse announcement yeah. of an announcement coming? Lol. Hopefully Kingdom Come too. Thanks for the entertainment tent. Cheers. Thank you, my friend. Cheers, cheers, cheers. Um yeah like look at this in case you guys missed it i guess new segment look at this okay buckle up buckaroo some of you guys are with me you've been fans of kingdom come deliverance i think it dropped in 2017. that sounds about right right 2017 i think it was so it's been a while and we've been waiting to hear what warhorse the the studio behind it has been doing we've just been patiently patiently waiting and they just casually drop this tweet sorry post on x yesterday afternoon new game reveal thursday april 18th at 20 hours cest on youtube and twitch oh baby oh baby I, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty stoked on this. I've, or I guess 2018 is what they're saying. So 2018, uh, it was written on the page. I just needed to read classic YouTuber problem, not reading. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm super pumped for this. I'm very, very excited. I started going through the comments and replies here, trying to see if there was any information to be gleaned because right now all we have is this picture of a horse and a guy on the horse seems medieval themed, but there's not much. But I started looking through it and there's like, will it feature a warhorse soap though? That's the real question. Uh, please let there be horses. And they say, well, there is one on the picture at least. And so like, I think they're implying that the picture is of the game that they're revealing, right? It's not just that this is a generic picture from their studio, like list of wallpapers that they have from, from kingdom come deliverance and if this is a picture of the the game that they're working on if this is an actual image from the game 
which I don't know if it is. Jeez. It looks a pretty fire. Uh, I, I don't know, though. I don't know. Could just be a random picture. And he's like, yeah, but there's a picture of a horse in the in the image post revealing this. So who knows? I, I do think they're probably dropping a sequel. We know that Kingdom Come Deliverance did very, very well. They even post here sold over 6 million copies. Not all of those at full price, but this was considered to be a pretty niche game and it just exploded. Tons of people played it and loved it. I'm one of those people. And so it seems as though they've gotten a much bigger budget. Obviously, they've gotten a lot of time to work on it. So I think the stakes are pretty high, but also I think they've poured a lot more into this than they have previously. So I'm very, very excited. I mean, any game that takes six years to put together is probably going to be pretty damn ambitious, especially coming from a, a well-established studio with a big budget. So I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, I mean, as for what they need to do for me to be happy, literally just Kingdom Come Deliverance with some of the jank polished up just a little bit, just a little bit. Cause it was, it was pretty rough around the edges. It still was playable and stuff, but if you've ever played kingdom come deliverance, you know, like the combat can be a little janky, the navigation and like walking around, um, the nav meshes are a little bit janky and not super precise. And, uh, I, I think that it it's just a really, really good game if you can put up with that jankiness. But if they can do the same game, but just polished around the edges and just really, really refined, I think we'd be in for one hell of a treat. I'll tell you what. Tell you what. Um, I just hope it's not on CryEngine. I feel like we dug into this before, and I, I think it is. I think it is because we pulled up their website. Let's do this in real time. Uh, Warhorse Studios. Do they have like a, a full official website? Kingdom Come Deliverance. Warhorse Studios. Okay. Um, it's all in a different language. That's going to make it tough to read. Contact careers, maybe. Houdini programmers. Okay. Um, MS Visual Studio environment. Good English. Has to know check. Uh, da, 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 da. This doesn't clearly outline it. Multiple platforms, develop of game systems. Have experience, pressure, professional game development. Um, performance, SVN, or Perforce, Mercurial. We offer work on a worldwide successful game. Ooh. I don't... I feel like we dug into this once, though. Was anybody here on stream when we did that? I feel like we dug through a bunch of this and we found that it actually listed their engine again. That they were using the same tool set. <laughs> Are you applying for a job on stream, Luke? I, so funnily enough, I actually have signed up for a bunch of email notifications on different email addresses from big publishers and studios. So for one, like I wanted to know, or I still do want to know if they're going to bring any live service stuff to Hogwarts Legacy's sequel. So you know what I did? I went and with a few different email addresses, I signed up for email notifications of job offerings and openings at Warner Brothers Avalanche. So if they ever post a job requesting somebody with like live service experience or knowledge of in-game shops or something, and that's listed in the like requirements or uh, nice to haves, I'll know and I'll be able to report out on that. 
So I, I have actually gone to the steps of <laughs> uh, asking for notifications on a lot of job openings and offerings, which I, I would rather know. So I signed up with all that. Um, we used to do the same thing to be fair, uh, fair when I worked in commercial real estate where we wanted to know if there were other good deals and like really solid properties available. So we would just create a bunch of different profiles of different people and they each had their own like Gmail inboxes and we would pretend basically to be investors and go and sign up for the email lists of different brokerage firms. So when they sent out emails with all the new listings they had, we would also get it. So we could show it to our clients. <laughs> it was a whole thing. Prismatic <laughs> donated 10 Canadian dollars. The whole thing. Chat. The character's outfit on the horse is giving me Victorian London vibes. That would be a cool game. Congrats on 500K. Here's to the next 500K. Yes, thank you, my friend. Kinda. I do get, get what you mean. The coat doesn't look very medieval. CMMNDRNCHF11 donated $4.99 through Super Chat. You've mentioned you enjoy classically PC games, City Builders, Settlers, Age of Empires, Total War. Would love your thoughts and content on those. Um, Yeah, I... I like the OG one that I think made me fall in love with those games were the old school Stronghold Crusader games. I played the crap out of those. So did my brothers and stuff. We still will play it occasionally just for fun because it's just a, a throwback. But yeah, those old school Stronghold Crusader games, I played the ever living crap out of. And uh, in fact, when my internet was down just a few days ago, I played some of those because I haven't installed and it's just a really easy game to pop into. It's not always online, so you can do that. And just a really good time. Yeah, I love those. I love those. Um, yeah, Brandon, I see I see what it did. I gotta I probably need to tweak that. Because how it does it is it for whatever reason it doesn't read. It's said to read super chats at five dollars and up. Or if you go through the uh Streamlabs tip link it'll do it three dollars and up but it does a currency conversion so if it's five australian dollar redos it converts it and then determines if it's going to read it when i don't want it to do that um so i'll have to see if there's an option for that but i think that's what happened because I, I didn't hear it read off uh but thank you brandon um for the five australian dollar redos would you rather never share an opinion again or randomly blurt out an intrusive thought in public daily well i basically already do the latter and i've turned it into a career so i'll stick with the latter <laughs> that's basically my my whole job so <laughs> i'll just do that <laughs> uh thank you my friend it was confirmed by tom henderson that it is the sequel okay then I'm here for it already. I'll tell you what, if this is in fact a like screen grab or something from the game, and this is actually in the game, this is on another level. I mean, the, the fur and the hair on the horse is ridiculous. It might just be a picture of a damn horse, but if this is actually running in engine, Oh, Oh baby. I'm going to scream. But at the very least, it shows that they're doing a sequel uh, or the Tom Henderson thing shows they're doing a sequel. I'm here for it. I I believe they're using their original engine, so I don't expect it to be totally new or changed. But it's not necessarily the end of the world. The original game when it released wasn't bad looking. It's just janky. Like you'll have some moments where like, wow, this is gorgeous. And then there's other moments where like, oh my God. So it's just a little all over the place. And I'm hoping after the success of the first game, they've just been able to pour tons of time and money and effort into refining those things. So I'm here for it. I'm here for it. And I'm very, very hopeful because it's, it's pretty rare, honestly, to get a really solid, like, hardcore rpg especially in a grounded historical setting like it's just very very rare to get that 
um it seems like if we ever get something like that it's always a fantasy game or it's like hardcore but it doesn't take itself very seriously so like it really helped this game stand out and uh i, I i'm just I'm here for the sequel. I want it badly. Hopefully we get like a little reveal, a little trailer, and then we get like a full reveal at like maybe the Xbox showcase or something in June. That would be really cool. That would be really, really cool. But time will tell. I know it's a yawn. Yeah, I couldn't cover it up. I've got my coffee. I just haven't been consuming it fast enough. <laughs> um. Okay, okay. Oh yeah, player 11, having a great day. Rocking and rolling. When do you think Mafia 4 will be revealed or released? Mafia 3 was four years ago now. I mean, honestly, I when was Mafia Definitive Edition? 2020? Hanger 13. So the, this is the studio behind the Mafia games. They have four different studios as of 2018. And so they did Mafia 3 and Mafia Definitive Edition. They also are doing Top Spin 2K25. Being developed by 2K and Hangar. It seems a little random for them to be doing that, but okay. But they did Mafia 3 eight years ago. Mafia Definitive Edition four years ago. And they're doing something else. So I mean, whatever it is, they're they're going pretty hard hardcore with it. Didn't they do a like wasn't there an article or something about them having to like completely rebuild some stuff? Let's see. It's unclear when or where it will be set, but based on story progression, a Scarface like 1980 settings wouldn't be out of the question. How much info? Yeah. Yeah, they confirmed it in 22 that they were working on it, which didn't really surprise anybody, but I I mean, I think we could reasonably expect to see it soon as for when it releases i don't know it's not a very big studio so i don't know but I, man i'm looking forward to it after mafia 3 i was like oh i don't know if they can do this anymore this is like a big swing and a miss but then we got mafia definitive edition and that was so good it was like oh my god where have you guys been that was great so I, I, I mean, my faith was restored. Okay. Anyway, I guess we should touch on the sort of elephant in the room, which is the Fallout show, right? Should we touch on that? So as for the Fallout show, I have not been able to watch actually as much as I, I wanted to, um, but we did start it and I am thoroughly enjoying it. It's actually struck a really good balance and tone. I won't get into any spoilers or anything because I know some people are waiting to like the weekend to watch it and I'll also ask everybody in chat not to, uh, not to spoil anything. Um, so I'll speak very vaguely, but I, I think they've actually done a really, really good job with it, especially the production design is so well done. Like there's so many little nods, whether it's like the junk cannon, which you see at one point or the little bitty stuff with like, you know, somebody gets injured and they heal themselves with a stim pack or um, just like so many little bitty nods to the games where if you know the games, you'll pick up on them and go like, oh, that's awesome. But if you don't, you can still enjoy it. Now, funnily enough, I was actually watching this with, of course, my wife, Nikki, and she has never really played the Fallout games. She was going to try playing Fallout 4, but 
she uh, got through the like intro of Fallout 4 where the kid is kidnapped. And when she was trying to play it, we had just had Lachlan. And so she was like, nope, 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 can't do that. It, it was just too much for her. So she shut the game down and went and played like The Witcher 3 or something. And so she's never played the Fallout games. So she has had no exposure to the lore or to those little bitty things. So it was interesting seeing her watch the show and try to fill in the blanks. And so I'm very familiar with Fallout as a franchise, but she's not familiar really at all. So we like we were able to watch uh, whatever episode, you know, and then we could go back and she'd be like, so what was going on here? I don't know what that was supposed to be or I don't know why they did this or said that, you know, what's this character? Who are the Brotherhood of Steel? Like, this is kind of weird. So it was really, really interesting um, to kind of get the two opposite sides of the, the spectrum watching it at the same time. So my takeaway is that for people not familiar at all with fallout it is tough to follow at first similarly to like the witcher show when that first dropped you know season one of the witcher on netflix where it was very like it was very very like it jumped around a bunch between different characters and timelines and stuff so if you weren't already familiar with the story you might have trouble figuring out what's going on and she said that she was having similar frustrations where they were just bouncing around a ton. Um, I, it settles into itself. And, you know, once the timelines and stories kind of group up and start to interweave a little, it's easier to follow. But at, at first it was tougher to follow. So I, I think it's very uh, like there's a lot of fan service, a lot of things that fans of Fallout will appreciate. But I think if you're totally new to the franchise, it might be a little tough to follow uh, at first. Um, but beyond that, like, I think, yeah, somebody, Mr. Mirror, I'm still at episode two, one hour of episodes feels long for me. I will say the episodes are, are quite long. I think the first episode's like an hour 15. The second one is similar. So they're long episodes for sure. They try to cram a lot in there. Um, and in terms of pacing, you know, they're, they're fine. It, it they do tend to drag a little bit, but I've I've really enjoyed it and I feel like it takes the world of Fallout seriously. I, I saw some people saying that Bethesda was trying to retcon all of like Fallout New Vegas and stuff. I haven't finished the show, so I don't know for sure, but it doesn't seem like the retcons are that hefty. It seems like they've wiggled some stuff around a little bit, um, but it doesn't seem like they've totally scrapped like New Vegas or anything. They haven't done anything like that, which some people were kind of acting as though they were. But it's it's not that bad as far as I can tell. Um, yeah, apparently it's like one of the last episodes that they do or they mention New Vegas or something. And it's particularly frustrating for some hardcore fans. But as of right now, I haven't seen anything super, super bad. Um, I mentioned at one point that the show is is really solid but it makes me wish we had gotten also a fallout game from a different studio and i think it's because like i mentioned this before but fallout 3 and fallout 4 i, I they're built around being escapist entertainment and i showed that clip of emil pagliarulo mentioning that and that was kind of one of their premises when designing the game is that it's escapist entertainment you just try not to get wrapped up in the seriousness of all of it and I think that that's reflected in the stories that they tell. That's reflected on a lot of the the things. And while the show has nods to it, like at one point they show a kid climbing out of a refrigerator. You know, he had kind of guarded it himself in, in the refrigerator during a big conflict, bringing up that side quest in Fallout 4. Like the show takes itself much more seriously. In Fallout 4, that side quest is laughably terrible because the kid's supposed to have been in there for like 200 years a very long time and then he just like casually pops out and goes and finds his, finds his parents and everything is fine like it's really really weird so i i think i appreciate more than anything that the show takes the story very seriously but it reminded me just of how not seriously the games take their story and that's always been a frustration of mine that 
like Fallout 3 did a better job of it than Fallout 4. Fallout 4 is just weird because like, oh, your kid's been kidnapped. Go save them. But first, spend an hour tearing apart buildings and then building a little bitty base. And then also go over here, get distracted, collect some bobbleheads and, and stuff. And then, yeah, you should probably get back to finding your child who's been kidnapped and the murderer of your spouse. But, you know, only get to that once you've had some fun elsewhere. You know, it just doesn't take itself super seriously. And part of that's by design because they want you to just goof around and not, like, be miserable. But I feel like Fallout 4 tried to do both. It tried to be just escapist, silly, goofy entertainment while also trying to put a really intense story in front of you. And so it just didn't do either as well as it could have. Similarly with Fallout 3, it just doesn't have a very good story, but I think that the way the, the game is built is much better than Fallout 4. I think it works way better. Um, because you can justify just leaving your father to go wander around and like do whatever he's doing. You can justify exploring the world more and you can role play a little easier. Whereas in Fallout 4, if you're taking the story seriously, you're just going to have a bad time. Um, and similarly with Fallout New Vegas, they built it in a way where they tell you straight up. And this was one of the, the interviews. I forget who it was, but um, one of the writers for Fallout New Vegas said they wanted to make sure early on that if players wanted to just abandon the main quest to Fallout New Vegas, they could do that and that they'd be supported in doing that because they wanted to have everything set up in a way where you can make your own story and if you follow in the footsteps of their story and what they've outlined cool go to new vegas and meet mr house and all this but if you don't want to do that you don't have to just go wander around do whatever doesn't matter and that's the difference between a studio that's trying to make a role-playing game first and foremost and a studio like Bethesda, which is kind of making their own genre in real time. They just kind of do their own thing. Whether it works or not is up in the air. But all of this to say, the Fallout show has reminded me just how compelling the Fallout universe can be for telling stories. And it, it especially reminded me that we haven't had a really good Fallout game with, with Fallout stories in over a decade and that's kind of frustrating which of the main protagonists is the the strongest i think it depends i think they all, each are reflections of different paths you can take if you were to find yourself in that situation um you know you can lean fully into just the craziness and the the chaos and the drugs and everything or you can try to pursue uh, like strength and power and force or you can try to to seek out compassion and some of the more human elements that are, are more civilized it's interesting again i haven't finished it yet so i'm not sure which of the characters i like the most but they each have their own quirks their own specific uh traits which i i really like i really like um, do you prefer this show or The Last of Us? And let's throw Arcane in two. I mean, honestly, like, they're just different. Like, I know it's easy to just be like, well, they're both video game adaptations, so let's just compare them. But I don't think it's that straightforward. Because The Last of Us is an adaptation of a game which is built primarily around the narrative. I mean, that's it's pretty much a story game, and that's that. Whereas Fallout, I think, personally, is a much tougher thing to adapt because it's so open-ended and of course with this it's an original story so it's not like they just took the story of fallout 4 and are just turning that into a video game in this case like they're writing something from scratch so i guess you could say that's a freedom but it's also a restraint at the same time because there's a lot more you got to do a lot more heavy lifting for sure so i i would say at this point based on what i've seen i think the fallout show is more impressive to me because it's an original story, and I think it's a lot harder to turn Fallout 4 into a show. But they're different. You know, I just think they're different. As for Arcane, I haven't finished Arcane. Don't get mad at me. I know. I know. I know. 
I know I haven't finished it. I start I got like an episode in and then something happened. Uh Edge Runners is maybe another good comparison. Edge Runners is also up there with this. Where it's also very unique, very original, but true to the source material. So, yeah. They're both very, very good. Raphael, thank you for the super chat. My goodness. Hey, Luke, congrats on 500k. Sorry for changing the subject. I've been thinking of what happened to Baldur's Gate 3 on series S. Do you believe GTA 6 could also be affected in any way? I mean, now that Phil Spencer set the precedent that you can get an exception and not have all the features available on the Series S. I think, you know, if Take-Two approaches Phil and it's like, hey, we're going to try to release on the Series S, but we need to be allowed to not bring these features or whatever, I think he's going to make an exception. Like, there's no way that he tries to put his foot down for that. Yeah, Whitest Rabbit, thank you for the two. The show gives me hope for a good Bioshock series. Yeah, I mean, it, it shows that at least... There's a possibility for good video game adaptations. Whereas before, like five to 10 years ago, it was like, no, if there's a video game adaptation, it's going to suck ass. But at least now there's a chance. Sometimes they can still blow it. I mean, obviously, like The Witcher is an adaptation of a book series. Um, where is it? I think it's actually just behind there. Yeah, those are them. There's a blue light that makes it not look red, but those books right there. So it's an adaptation of a book series, first and foremost, but still kind of related to gaming but with those uh with that series i mean they just catastrophically dropped the ball for sake of activism and rewriting the story to make it more about empowerment and stuff it was just a tragedy because the witcher show had so much potential and was so good and they just blew it so Yeah, exactly, Katie. Now they're not doomed to suck. They might, but they're at the very least, it's not like a foregone conclusion. They have the chance of being good. Um, yeah. Oh, Luke, you did not uh, damage your thumb again. Don't think I don't see that Band-Aid. No, so the, the Band-Aid, the wrap that I have around my thumb is because the nail, it's still on there but it's starting to like lift off so it's falling off um but it's it's still like attached on the far right side so it's not fully coming off and everybody i've talked to everybody even like the doctor says just leave it it'll fully like unlatch or disconnect whatever when it's ready to just leave it on there as long as you can and when it falls off, it falls off. So I put this over so it doesn't get caught on anything and rip off. But yeah, it's it's on its way. It's on its way. Um, blah, 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 blah. Also, it was freaking people out. Like if I'm in the car and I go to like the bank or a drive through or something and I reach out to like hand my card or something through the window my gross necrotic thumb is on top and it freaked people out so i just started rapping it and people <laughs> people shut up about it i i got like two or three comments of people oh my god it's like okay that hurts my feelings okay <laughs> grab some pliers let's get gore i think actually today it, it might be the day it's very 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 close ew zombie yeah exactly it's worked for a couple gags, pretending that like playing Suicide Squad was sucking my life force out through my thumb. You know, that that was good. But I also was getting comments from people. Somebody commented on one of our videos right after it happened. It was like, wow, Luke's fallen off. He's going all woke. He started painting his fingernails. Bro, it's, it's a bloodied, like busted thumb. I swear, these people like just look everywhere and start to see shadows of of sweet baby ink everywhere they look. It's so stupid. Like I saw this. Hold on. Let me sh let me just share this picture. This was really funny. And then, <laughs> so I came across this. 
Um, but it's like, you know, these bait posts that always catch people, you know? This is my transmasculine brother and transphobes think he's a girl. Too bad for them because he will always be a man. And then uh, wh uh, whatever, trans pride flag, whatever. It's a picture of MatPat, okay? <laughs> it's a game theory. And this guy, MAGA1957, uh, totally bit the bait. No, he is not. That is clearly a woman. <laughs> Tell your sister that she's been brainwashed. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. It's just, it's very funny. Cause like you put the bait out there, see if they're going to catch it. <laughs> and they do. <laughs> I, I wonder what MatPat would say to that. That is clearly a woman. You're not getting anything past me. This <laughs> is so funny. Oh man. Yeah. When you blend your identity with politics, everything you view or everything you do is viewed as a stance. Yeah. No, it, it's just like <laughs> even to the point where you smash your thumb and people think you're making a political statement it's like no, no i just crushed my thumb there was there was nothing political going on about it you know <laughs> it's just oh it was not that that magical okay quick palate cleanser and then we're gonna talk about these little things i can't stop playing with uh for a second okay let me I forgot I had a picture of, of Jeffree Star pulled up. And so <laughs> it was a little bit of a jump scare for a second. Um, okay. Oh yeah, then we'll talk about this. Okay. Let's just mention this real quick before we, before we do that. Uh, just so you guys know, just so you know, um, everybody after the fallout show has been like, oh, geez. So I wonder now if we're going to get a, um, you know, like a, a, a Elder Scrolls six or Elder Scrolls just in general TV show tie in. It just makes sense. Like they've made 15 versions of fall or of a uh, Skyrim. Why don't they do a, a TV show based on Skyrim? And Todd Howard has said, as of right now, there's nothing that's happening. He said, quote, everybody asks like about Elder Scrolls and I keep saying no also. You know, if someone's going to click, I think this really came out of, we think things are aligning to do a high quality job. It wasn't forced. And he continued, I can't predict the future, but this has been one of the most enjoyable projects I've ever done. And we're just over the moon, everybody in the studio with seeing it in this way. Um, very clunky way of saying it, but basically they don't have anything in the works right now for an Elder Scrolls adaptation. It's it's not been on their, their to-do list and they haven't heard any pitches that really made sense. After the Fallout show's success, I think they probably push it uh, and, and try to make it happen. You might see Amazon come and contact them uh, once we see how the rest of the show does if like over the next few weeks, it continues to do well. So I, I would expect we probably see something because it just makes too much sense. Like Elder Scrolls is a huge IP. They were about to drop about to in like three, four years, but they're going to drop Elder Scrolls six. So it just makes sense. Start working on it now. Drop a show tie in shortly before or shortly after the new game. Get people to buy it for 70 bucks. Like, why not? Why not? It just makes sense, right? I think Elder Scrolls is particularly tough to adapt. Like Fallout is very unique, but for the average consumer, I think the Elder Scrolls just kind of comes off as generic fantasy. And I know I'm going to trigger the crap out of some people with that, but it, I, I really think that to the average consumer, it is just fantasy yeah i think it's because that's what it is and i think it's particularly difficult to adapt something that is just very milk toast compared to fallout where you see one outfit from the fallout universe and you know what franchise it is you know it's it's extremely iconic it's very very unique whereas elder scrolls like if you were to do a, a live action 
version of this shot minus the the helmet okay just get rid of the helmet because this is like very uniquely uh skyrim this specific shot but if you were to just do like a a village like this and then rework it so it's real life it could be the witcher it could be from wheel of time it could be the elder scrolls it could be from uh from like rings of power it could be from any sort of things or just vikings yeah um so i i think that that's the particularly difficult thing about adapting it i think that that's uh why fallout is probably easier to adapt than this but they still could find success with it don't get me wrong um I think there's potential like within the lore of Elder Scrolls to do some interesting things. But when you're trying to sell something to Amazon Prime subscribers, like an interesting storyline that you'll catch on to two, three, four episodes in, that's not as compelling as just having a super iconic, very unique setting that you can sell very easily. Like those first, like, I wonder if I can actually pull it up. Um, Fallout show. Fallout on Amazon Prime. Like, you just see this, and you instantaneously know it's Fallout. Even if she wasn't wearing the vault outfit, just the shape of the doorway tells you Fallout. You know? Whereas the average uh, person looking at Elder Scrolls stuff isn't necessarily going to be able to tell Oh, that's the Elder Scrolls. It's going to come off as generic fantasy project number five. And what stories do you tell in the like universe of the Elder Scrolls that are going to be really, really compelling to a brand new audience? Because again, that's what they're trying to appeal to with these shows. They're not trying to just keep gamers happy. They're trying to get everyday people that have an Amazon Prime subscription to watch it and to feel like their membership is justified. And why do they have x-ray? What the hell is x-ray? Is that like the thing where you can click on somebody and it tells you who they are? I bet that's what it is. Like, oh, HDR, UHD, that's nice. And then they're like, yeah, and we also have x-ray. Wow, they've really taken the production values up a bit. So I understand his hesitance to commit to anything. I, I think it's a lot tougher to adapt the Elder Scrolls than Fallout. Could work. Could work. But... Um, no, I, I know Morrowind's not generic, but if they're trying to pitch something to Amazon Prime, I don't think they can do Morrowind the show. I think if they pitched it as Skyrim but a show, executives are going to eat that up. Like, they could do Elder Scrolls Arena the show. I don't think that ever gets greenlit. I, I don't think that ever gets a budget <laughs> given to them. But I think if they framed it as oh, well, it's Skyrim, like that really successful video game that's on your Alexa and your, your like, TV and everything. You can play it on your toaster. I think they agree to that much, much quicker. Give me a Deathloop show. I, I think a Deathloop show would be easier to make than a lot of shows because it also has a very unique art style, too. And the time loop mechanic would work really well for a show over like 10 episodes. You could do that. Um, I also think that like 12 minutes would work really well for a show. I think that could work really well. Just a quick like one season thing. That show, that game is insane though. Because you're like, oh, I think I have it figured out. And then they just continue to drop twists and you're like, wait, what? And then they just casually kind of toss in some incest and you're like, wait a second. <laughs> it just, it keeps getting crazier and crazier. If you've not played it, I won't spoil the whole thing for you, but that is a crazy thing. As for other adaptations that could be good, um, I think The Forgotten City would be really good as well. It probably wouldn't work as well since that game is so about you experimenting with it. But yeah, Red Dead also, you know, could do very, very well 
We just don't get a lot of like Western stuff anymore, unfortunately. But I mean, Red Dead as well is also like to an, uh, somebody not familiar with Red Dead. Red Dead comes off as just like more generic Western. So you'd have to find a way to frame it in a unique way. But Red Dead and Rockstar games in general are so massive that I think the name actually carries some weight. Yeah, like a Red Dead show or movie for HBO where they go really dark. Oh, oh, that could work. Um, real quick, I don't know why. I don't think our night bot is working on YouTube. Has anyone in YouTube chat seen Nightbot? I know it's working on Twitch, but it's not working on YouTube. And I don't know why. Because I set it up, so it should be. What is 12 Minutes? 12 Minutes is just a, a really kind of experimental game. It had, like, James McAvoy, Willem Dafoe, um... What's her name? I think it was the lady that played Ray in the Star Wars. Daisy Ridley, I think. It's got a really good cast. Really, really good cast. Um, community settings. Da, da, da. Okay. Well, let's try this. Do, 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 do. Okay, let's see if Nightbot comes in now. I don't know why it's not working. It's really, really weird. Because we should, like, it should just be. Yeah, I don't know what the deal is. Let me try to clear it out. Oh, that's why it's daytime and it's night <laughs> Uh, Stream element of the night bot. Close all of these. Okay. Sorry, fam. I don't know what the uh, what the problem is. Hit save. Okay. Let's see. Um, what's the most insane thing that a company asks you to do while or before reviewing their game? Uh, honestly, I don't think there's been any crazy requests. Have there been any crazy, crazy requests? Um, like there's the occasional question where they're like, Hey, uh, we know you ran into this problem, but we promise it's going to be fixed by launch day. And one time I forget what game it was. But one time there was an instance where I kind of took them at their word and it it didn't end up <laughs> like being the case. They didn't end up fixing anything that they said they were fixing. Um, so sometimes there's stuff like that that happens. Uh, but I can't think of anything like particularly inappropriate or anything you know I, i've never i have gotten a couple of requests where they're like hey we're going to give you a copy of the game early but don't share any footage that you film before this day so i've, I've gotten that you know where it's like hey this you're going to be playing the alpha build but we're also going to give you access to the launch build just don't share any stuff from the alpha build 
That I think is more fair because it's not like, you know, it, it, I don't think that's particularly fair, but um, yeah, I can't think of anything like really egregious that anybody's asked for. With Alan Wake 2, they had bugs and they had some stuff that they said was, was being fixed and like the game breaking bug that I ran into that caused all progress to stop that was was really really rough but basically it was like they they did fix it my understanding is they did fix it but it required me to do a new run like to create a new save basically to scrap the old one and start from scratch because it like they couldn't just patch the save file or something and so they fixed it, but they fixed it in a way where I couldn't test it with the 12 hours until embargo lifted or whatever. So it was like, okay, I'll, I'm going to still tell everybody I ran into this problem because I have to, but, uh, I mean, I'm going to hope that you're telling the truth and that this isn't a problem, but I don't know for a fact that that's the case, you know? But there's just some instances like that where you just you could take them at their word and i don't think they're trying to lie to you or anything but you just don't know what you don't know it might end up being the case that it, it doesn't actually get fixed but they thought they fixed it or maybe they were just in fact lying to you you just don't know um have you ever refused to review a game on the grounds that it's mid? I mean, I get asked every day to review different games of different sizes and scales and scopes, a lot of like indie games and stuff. And unfortunately there are some games where I'm like, I just, I just don't think this is going to be interesting to the audience. I don't think they're going to enjoy watching a review on it. I don't think I want to spend all that time reviewing it. So I'm just going to pass, you know, that happens all the time. And whether it's like, because it's mid, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily fair because that's not always the case, but there are plenty of occasions where I've been asked to review a game and it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't think that it's worth the time because it's like reviewing a game is not as simple as, oh, just we'll play it. Just review it. Just share your thoughts. It's like, no, you're asking me to commit probably dozens of hours and dozens of hours that, I mean, time is money. That means I'm probably going to have to skip streams. I'm going to have to uh, maybe skip a video or two. Like you're asking me to set aside a ton of time and lose a lot of money to review a smaller indie game that nobody's going to watch or enjoy the review of. Like, I understand it's frustrating because it's like, I would love to be able to review every game and give every indie dev a, a chance. But at some point, like I have employees, I have to pay their salaries. I have uh, a family to provide for. Like sometimes it just doesn't work. Um, yeah, Gollum was an interesting case because I had a gut feeling that game was going to be really bad. So I was like, oh, I'll review this because I think I'll... Like this could actually end up just being funny and interesting. And I booted it up and got like an hour in and I was like, oh, this is a dumpster fire. Oh God. So then I played through the whole thing and was like, okay, yeah, no, I can, I can talk about this. Um, and it ended up, ended up being, you know, a big video and a big topic of last year. But that was something where like, oh, if there's a game I think has potential for people to be interested in. If I think it's going to be really, really good, or if I think it's just very unique, or maybe it's going to be super bad and it could be really funny how bad it is. In those cases, I might go in and actually like start the game, play an hour or two just to see what it's like. And then if I'm not feeling it, I'll back off. There are a couple of platforms that have requirements where they're like, okay, we're going to give you a game review code, but you have to agree you're going to make two videos on it. Or you, you have to agree you're going to make a review and publish it on this channel and they give you the link of your channel and all this. And that's a really good way to get me to not talk about your game at all. Like, 
Okay, if you're going to like try to strong arm me into making coverage, we're not we're not doing that. We ain't doing that. Um ba 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 ba. So, uh, yeah, I don't I don't mess with that. Let's see. Okay, this says this should work. Why isn't this working? Okay. Never mind, it's not working. I broke it, never mind. Okay. And then there we go. Okay. New segment time? Yes. Uh, but would you review or play my asset flop game <laughs> flip game I made in high school? Dude, what was it like a, a couple weeks or maybe last week even? There was that one guy that came into chat and kept like spamming, asking me to like. He was like, oh, can you please listen to my music that I made? I was like, for one, what kind of stream do you think this is? Like, I don't. I don't do that. Like, I, I'm not T-Pain. I'm not listening to your, your latest albums. Like, what? And he just wouldn't stop. Like, he kept posting about it. Please? Please? I'm totally a big fan. Like, if you had to say totally a big fan, I don't think you are a big fan. <laughs> I think you just came in here and you just cycle through streams and you beg people to listen to your your SoundCloud album. Again, it's a really good way to get me to not ever listen to your stuff. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Streamlabs bot is working now. Hooray. Hooray. I don't know why it wasn't working before, but now it is, it is working. Okay. Voila. There we go. Okay. Um, blah, 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 blah. Luke Stevens music should be your new channel. It was just so random. Like, I get that. I actually get the music thing a lot, which makes me wonder if it's like a bot thing. Like, are they able to go in and create a bot that just scrubs channels with live streams and just asks, listen to my music, check out my latest album. You know, it's the same thing with like the bots that come in and it's like a scantily clad woman in the, the profile picture. And it's like, oh, pics in bio, links in bio. We could have a good time together. It's like, bro, you know, you can get a bot for everything nowadays. Yeah. I don't know. There's, I, I'm fine with talking to anybody that comes into chat and asks questions. Of course, like I give preference uh, or preference to people who give super chats and stuff because they're contributing. Like that's awesome. Um, So I, I, I'll respond to those for sure and you know with priority but i'm not gonna like ignore people in chat if if they're just leaving comments i won't be able to get to all of them but I'll, I'll read the comments but this isn't one of those things where i'm gonna like stop everything for the whole stream everything we're doing to go and listen to somebody's music you know it's just we're not doing that especially because you're just trying to take advantage of the audience. You know, I'm not going to do that to my audience and <laughs> we're not going to do that. Yeah. Notice me, senpai. Okay, Aram. Okay. Yeah, watch my theater class film, please. Big fan. Well, and like, if I were to say, yeah, and I don't like it, like I could ruin that person's day or month or year. Like, it's just not worth it. 
you know the odds of me i think people see that video of whatever the the dj uh or musician like he was listening to somebody in chat randomly who's like hey check out my my video i posted a bunch of lyrics i put a some vocals over your your hardcore beat and he loved it and like turned it into an actual release people see that and they're like oh that's gonna be me you know it's like that's it's probably not you know yeah yeah the dead mouse video yeah yeah Ugh. scratch some records dude yeah people see that video and they're like oh that's gonna be me so i'm gonna go ask everybody to listen to my stuff and it's like that was a viral clip because it's so rare that that happens you know like that doesn't just happen it's very uncommon which is why it went viral if it happened all the time it wouldn't go viral you know like i i can respect it i can respect the hustle but also you got to respect it if the creator doesn't want to like derail everything to listen to a random video or something you know look out here breaking hearts and dreams <laughs> it's just there's a time and place for everything you know time and place for everything um like there was that one guy who came onto a stream and he wanted like me to download his game that he had made and play it on stream and i was like i i mean i can't i can't just do that because i don't know if your if your game is like uh, content friendly. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that without getting in trouble. Like there's just too many variables. So I was like, well, I'll pull it up. And so I pulled it up in a tab off to the side on my, my other monitor. And I was like, okay, I'll check it out after stream. So after the stream ended, I actually did pull it up and it was like a straight up asset flip. Like it, it was just a collection of unreal engine assets. And it was just like plopped in there and you ran around and you like used a basic animation to punch rocks that would give you points and stuff. And I was like, okay, so like, this is probably like a 12, 13, 14 year old kid who just wanted to show something he made. And I can admire that, you know, he's, he's doing the thing. Cool. But it was not like, I don't think it would have been that helpful for me to watch that on stream like it might have actually like how am i supposed to respond to it you know so it's just it, our general policy we also have people asking to watch youtube videos and stuff and so our policy at this point has just been nope luke prepares the like to-do list of things we're going to talk about on the day i might pull something up randomly on stream but uh i'm not going to just pull up any link that people post like i'm, I'm just not going to do that it's just because it just takes one person trying to be funny that gets you to click on a link that has like nudity in it or something for all of this to go away. Like that's all it really takes. So we're just not going to risk it. I'm not going to risk it for your biscuit, you know? Yeah. Even if you were nice, the chat may have been ridiculing and laughing. Nothing good can come from that. Exactly. Like it's just not worth the, the trouble, if that makes sense. Or like a snuff film. Yeah. Th and th there's so many horror stories of streamers that have had people try to do stuff like that to them. Um, and even streamers who have done it to themselves. Like that Vouch thing <laughs> where he pulls up his computer like folder or whatever. And it's just got a bunch. I forget what they call it. But there's like a name for cartoons with like kids and bestiality and stuff. And he's just got that sitting on his computer. And he... Because he clicked on the wrong folder. He's like, oh, oops. He's probably fine because his community is weirdly tolerant of that kind of thing. But um, yeah, <laughs> I don't I don't want to have a situation where somebody links me clips or something like that. And then because I was trying to be nice, everything's ruined. Um, Random little tidbit, new segment. And then we can get to the the tomorrow thing now that we have the uh the chat box or chat bots actually working it seems um 
this is this is interesting okay news segment maybe that's why he thought i was t-pain so here's the deal everybody has been keeping an eye at this point on hellblade 2 the latest game from ninja theory and there's some things that are going on with it that are interesting that are different the um oh i'll pause because our our frame rates are plummeting i don't know why are we back hold on we randomly we had like five seconds of of buffering i think we're back okay it looks stable okay anyway so We've been keeping an eye on Hellblade 2 because it, it's a game from a studio that I respect a lot. Uh, they made, of course, the original Cell, Hellblade Cinema Sacrifice that was really, really good and very unique and different and quirky. And they've been away working on this sequel for a while. And what's weird is that, for one, the studio's founder has left. Granted, he sold his studio for over $100 million. So a lot of people are like, no, he just got his bag and he ran off. Can you blame him? Not really. Still uncommon because a lot of creative types, even after they get their bag, they stick around. And a lot of studio sales require leadership to stay for a while. That's actually one of the reasons that a lot of Bungie-focused content creators are braced for kind of a total implosion of Destiny in the next, I think, year and a half, two years. Because I believe it's at the end of 2024 five Joe Raptor would know off the top of his head but I believe it's the end of 2025 that a bunch of their contracts for the leader the leadership that was set to stay there after the PlayStation acquisition all those contracts expire so all of those people get like the option to stay or they can leave at that point with all their bonuses and everything and if that happens they are like they're they're screwed like all of the executives and old school designers of destiny are leaving all at the same time that could be bad so it's pretty common with acquisitions to have contracts that require the leadership and the the main headlining talent to stay so it was just kind of weird to hear that the founder of ninja theory the the chris angel looking guy that he left it's just a little strange and then there's other things that have dropped such as the fact that the game is reportedly only seven ish hours long they said it's about the same size as the original which means that they've spent about a year on each hour of content that the game has which is a, a pretty tough ratio i mean you compare that to like from software where they'll drop granted very very different games but uh you know they'll have 15 20 hours of gameplay for each year that they're in development so it's just very different. Even other narrative studios that are of a similar size are typically able to pump out more content per year that they've worked on it. So there's just a lot of strange things going on with Hellblade that make it interesting. Um, real quick, thank you. I, I see it. It popped, but it didn't read off for whatever reason. Um, thank you to the Super Chats. Do, 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 do. Oh, I didn't read a few of them. That's weird. Uh, okay. Uh, Prismatic, thank you for the five. Speaking of video game adaptations, I think Metroid would make a great sci-fi or even sci-fi thriller film, but I don't think Nintendo ever would. Yeah, I don't think they ever would because I think it would be really successful if they made it dark and gritty, and I just don't think that uh, they're going to do that. Um, and Kinomansky, thank you for the super chat as well. What do you think about Outlaw's facial animations? Um, I think we talked about it back when we saw the story trailer. To me, it's like the facial animations are fine. I, I don't think the, the character designs are what I would have done. But like if you think that the game is going to suck because some of the characters look too masculine or too feminine or whatever like that's a really bad reason to dismiss the game when there's other more valid reasons i think um so so yeah i i think that there's just i don't see it as a huge deal and i didn't think the facial animations were like that bad if it was like the uh what's that studio 
Uh, oh, Don't Nod. Like, Don't Nod, kind of a double-A studio, but their facial animations are really, really, like... Um, 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 like, they're really, really rough. If you've ever played, like, Vampire or... Um, oh, crap, what's that game called? The one with the two girls in the, like, seaside town. Do you remember... What's that one called? Oh, crap. I always forget what this game is called. It was the episodic game. Yeah, Life is Strange. Yeah, the Life is Strange lip sync and stuff. They have really rough lip sync. And if that was coming and if we saw similar qualities in Star Wars Outlaws, then I'd be like, yeah, this first like $70, $130 game, that would be rough. But I don't think it's anywhere near that bad. I don't, I don't, I personally don't think so. I didn't see anything, any clips that looked anywhere near that bad. Uh, Daniel, thank you for the five pound super chat. Uh, in honor of the king. Hey, Luke. Whoops, I pressed a button and it covered it up. Hey, Luke, thank you for the content. Do you see the, uh, did you see the price gouging structure slash structure for Star Wars Outlaws? Yeah, we actually just talked about it again at the very top of the stream. So I guess if you want to go back in the VOD, um, you can hear kind of the extended thoughts on it. I, I mean, my stance has been the same for this as it has been for like years. Don't pre-order anything. Don't buy the premium edition. Like, there's no reason to buy a $130 edition of a game to get a season pass for DLC that you don't know if it's, it's going to be good. It's assuming the game is worth full price, which we don't know it's worth full price. Like, nobody should be buying the premium editions, much less pre-ordering even the basic edition. Like, nobody should be doing this. Um, these companies have been doing this for years. Like, Ubisoft had multiple premium ultra editions going back to like AC Unity. So I think even further than that, honestly. So this is nothing new, unfortunately, but the rules still apply. Everything is still the same. Don't buy them. <laughs> okay, like same thing. Don't, <laughs> it's not that complicated. Um, so yeah, yeah. And Eric, thank you for becoming a member. Also appreciate you, my friend. Awesome. Don't not make banishers. Yeah, banishers is good. Lip sync and facial animations are also a little rough, but I think that they have the built-in. Um, it's not a get out of jail free card because I think it's just a matter of scope and scale. It's just a a uh, lower budget game made by a smaller team, and they price it as such. It's not a full seventy dollars game, and that's the whole thing. If you if you have like a couple of shortcomings with your game, if it's not like the most groundbreaking game graphically, that's okay. People just would ask that you don't charge groundbreaking prices. Like, it's not that complicated. And I, I think, unfortunately, it's just nowadays every studio is like, yeah, well, our game is, like, pretty good and we worked really hard on it, so it's $70. It's full price. And it's like, I get it. That's what makes the budget work for this. But if you're charging the same price as GTA 6, people are going to expect that level of quality. And if you fall short, you shouldn't be surprised when people call you out and are like, oh, look how bad this is in comparison to what I can spend my money on over here. You know, it's it's why I think like the, unfortunately, the AAA price point has kind of lost meaning and value because when everybody charges 70 bucks, including the top of the top, best of the best studios, it makes those mid-tier games that are priced there seem like a really bad value, you know, um, just by comparison, basically. Um, okay. But all of this brings me to this post, which is based off of an interview discussing Hellblade 2. Now they're doing a couple things to counter the frustrations with the shorter length. For one, if you are not playing the game through Game Pass, which I feel most people will, the game is digital only and costs 50 bucks. So it's not a full price game. It's a high production value game. It's a very, I'm sure it was expensive to make, you know, it, it's taken them seven years or so to put together, but they're not charging a full 70 which I can respect, you know, even being shorter, the lower price point makes it much more palatable. Um, and this is a lesson that the industry has learned from years past where shorter games always get into trouble. Even if their really high production value is, is a selling point, it's just, it's going to be a point of discussion 
It just will be. Same thing with like uh, the most iconic and recognizable instance of this was with uh, the Order 1886, which you might actually see the collector's edition of the Order 1886 up here. Um, that game, beautiful, stunning visually, crazy high production value. And actually a lot of the devs that worked on that game ended up going off and working at Naughty Dog and Sony Santa Monica. So that game kind of set up a lot of the talent that would go on to make some of the, the biggest and most recognizable games of the later PS4 generation. And that game cost full price, had a collector's edition, but it was like five hours long, six hours long. Some people got through it as short as four hours. It was a very, very short game. And it was just deemed unacceptable to charge full price, but not provide a, a super long campaign. It seems to me that most people's standards are about 15 hours. Like if you can't get to 15 hours, you shouldn't be charging full price. That seems to be the cutoff. Even Spider-Man 2, which was like 17 hours for most people, I think on average, that game even upset a lot of people. And so I think 15 is like the minimum you got to hit. You can say like, oh, but the, the production value is so crazy high that you know, that's just where it is, you know, and you spend, I, I heard one executive say in an interview, he's like, yeah, people just need to get a new perspective. They're spending 10 hours playing our game. That's really high production value and, and is crazy impressive. Took years and years to make. And they're upset that they're spending at the time. It was like 60 bucks. Cause I think it was an interview about the order 1886 and they're like, they're spending 60 bucks and they're upset about it, but they'll spend that money going out to the movies for two or three hours or for an evening to go get dinner and see the movie. And they're fine spending that much money with that form of entertainment, but with gaming, the standards are different. And it's like, yeah, I, I do think the standards are different. For one, you're not going out. You're staying at home, sitting on your couch, playing a game. Standards are different. Expectations are different. And it just is the case that players expect more for their money. So instead of complaining that it's not like the, the movie theater, maybe we should just learn how to deal with it, you know? So, um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, anyway, that's the whole thing. But what they've said countering this is that, quote, I think what we always set out to do was to tell a story for the game length to be appropriate for the story and for the game length to be appropriate for the story we want to tell. So it's not really a case of setting out to make shorter experiences. I think it is, there is a story that we want to tell here with a beginning, middle and end what and what is the right shape and size of experience to tell that story so that's kind of where we start he said digital distribution has opened up space for quotes uh, games of all shapes and sizes i i guess like it lowers cost of distribution um so i guess technically that's right he added quote so i'm really pleased to see that there's a lot of people that actually enjoy a shorter experience something that they can sit down on a whatever friday night stick their headphones on turn off the lights and kind of sink into an experience and players who don't necessarily want something that is 50 hours long 100 hours long so it's as long as it needs to be and i'm one of those people i like shorter games i think there's a lot of pressure from people's time or on people's time these days and i think our fans from what we hear from them they enjoy shorter game uh, a shorter game where our intention is that every step of the journey is meaningful there's an audience of people that want games that are focused and i think that that's true i do think there's a lot of people that want leaner meaner experiences so i do think that there's a place for that definitely and the ultimate get out of jail free card with this is just that it's on game pass. So even if you're like, yeah, the $50 price tag still might not be worth it for me being a, a seven, eight hour game. It's on game pass. So if you already have a subscription, you just download it, <laughs> you know, like game pass breaks all of our traditional understandings of like pricing and budgetary considerations. Like it just breaks it. Cause it's like, Oh, well, just download it. You probably already have a Game Pass subscription. Just download it, play it, whatever. Not that complicated, you know? And I have no doubt that this is going to be a really cutting edge game graphically and in terms of 
the ambition they've put forward here. And the original game was already really trippy, even though it was really short. But I do expect it'll probably grow a little repetitive, a little bit tedious. And frankly, I would rather the game cut itself off at eight hours if it's starting to get repetitive than try to stretch itself to 20 hours. You know, like I would rather the game quit while it's ahead than try to be something it's not. You know, this isn't going to be a 40, 50 hour game like God of War Ragnarok. So maybe don't pretend like it's going to be and try to force it. Um, and with Game Pass, yeah, if it's if it were three hours and it's on Game Pass, I can still be baffled that it took seven years to put together. But at the very least for me, it's not an added cost. So I'm still very interested. I still think there's some weird stuff going on with it. Uh, I... I am still just really weirded out by the departure of Tamim because Tamim was like a pretty high level guy. I mean, he was the writer director. He was the co-founder of the studio. He was the creative director for the studio. I mean, this would be like Neil Druckmann or Corey Barlog leaving their studios and then the studio just not mentioning it. Because that's what happened. They didn't tell anybody until, apparently, they were at... Yeah, on a recent visit, visit to UK-based studio, Polygon noted that there was no sign or mention of Antoniadis, I think, who was formerly the chief uh, creative director of the company. And so they reached out to executives and a spokesperson for Xbox. were like, where is he? Why wasn't he there? Is he sick? Is he okay? And like, oh, no, he doesn't work there anymore just weird it's just a little weird so it could be nothing again it could just be that he is just taking millions and going off doing his own thing you know if they sold how much did ninja theory sell for do they say in this article i don't think so how much did ninja theory sell for 117 million is what they were bought for. And he was a co yeah, he was a co founder. And I don't know if they had any other business partners, but at the very least, he probably took home a few million dollars. Maybe like 10, 20, 30 million. So he's probably doing great. You know, he's he's very comfortable financially. And maybe he did just bail. But it's still weird that they didn't mention it at all. You know, it's just a little weird. From what we know, he's uh, he did still work on the early development side of the game. So he was there for the first few years, maybe outlining some stuff. And then he left at some point. It's not super clear when. But. It's again, it's just a little it's a little unique. Could be nothing. Could be just a weird timeline and they just didn't mention it because like yeah it's not really important we thought it was going to worry people uh or it could be a sign of internal like drama within the studio who knows but all what what, what we do know is we looked it up on instagram he posts all the time uh pictures of him like off partying and stuff so even if he was like welcomed to leave or something and like executives had complaints against him and they're like okay go away which to be clear there's no evidence of that but even if he was like welcome to leave it seems like he just took his bag and went off and he's just partying like a madman so he's living his best life as far as we can tell but still just a very unique situation because you don't see that very often um as for everything else you know i'm still very hopeful for for hellblade i think it has a lot of potential as a game i just i, I want to see what they've got cooking because i have a feeling like they have a lot of cool stuff up their sleeves that they are not dropping and not revealing they're gonna wait until people actually see it which makes sense i mean if the game isn't that long it makes sense that you wouldn't actually go out and like reveal all your coolest stuff you keep some of it close to the chest and it seems like that's what they're doing here so we shall see oh. 
Do you think Manor Lords will blow up like Capel World or Helldivers? I would not bank on it. It's a very different kind of game. <clears throat> and those types of games don't tend to have a lot of mainstream appeal. They're much more niche, but that's okay. You know, the niche means that they're very committed and they will have a very devoted fan base. Um, but I, I think it's very niche. Whereas Pal World, like you hear the pitch and it's like, oh, it's basically the Pokemon game everybody's always wanted. It's like, okay, yeah, that'll probably blow up. And like Helldivers, that one also came off as more niche. But once people actually got to play it, they're like, oh, no, everybody's going to love this. So... Yeah. It's most wishlisted game on Steam. Yeah, but we also know that wishlists do not automatically translate to sales or necessarily to uh, final performance. You know, it shows people are interested in the concept, but whether they go about actually purchasing it is another question. I absolutely hope it's wildly successful because it looks really, really cool and it plays really well. Um, so I hope it, it blows up and I hope it's huge. I just don't think... It'll be anywhere near on the scale of like Hell Divers or, or uh, Pal World. I mean, those games were like each one of them was like a once every few year kind of phenomenon. The fact that we got two within like a month was insane. But that's why it was such a crazy story is that it was so rare. Um, yeah, the the scam before, <laughs> yeah, the scam before, yeah, that was the most wish listed game on Steam in history prior to this. So. Yes. Um, ba 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 ba. Okay. Let me see if this is working. Real quick, I want to. Oh my god, my chat is glitching. Let me see if this works. Yeah. Okay. So we'll do a quick shout out to uh, the sponsor for the stream today, um, which you guys for the last few weeks have seen me messing around with them because they're like, I'm a fidgety guy. I like to fidget with things. So these are called sty mags, just in case you are, you're also a fidgety person. This is just a pink variant, um, but they're just magnetic kind of playable toys, really simple. Uh, you can actually go and see in chat right now, the sty mags series two. Um, which I have linked there as well. And I can, whoop, I can make sure it's also popping over into uh, Twitch as well. But this is actually something that's been up on Kickstarter. And they have a few different versions of them. This is the Series 2, so it's kind of like the reworked uh, version of it that just has really strong magnets, really simple. They're very solid, very well built. And you guys have seen me playing with these <laughs> like on stream for weeks and even in some videos because I don't even realize I'm playing with them anymore. It's uh, become a bit of a problem. I, <laughs> I have a problem putting them down, but it's because it just keeps my fingers busy and my hands busy, which for me is uh, good. But you can check it out with that link in the stream chat if you are so interested. You can see that they initially had a $12,000 goal. They've hit 291000 it's doing quite well. So if you want to get in early and get a uh, a set of them, you can absolutely do that. Do that. It's got a patent pending. They are easy to carry around. They keep your hands busy. Like you can take just a few of them if you want and just kind of play around with the magnet and just kind of have them snap together. These are the loud variation, but the the quiet variation has a different kind of plastic that absorbs the sound a little bit better. Um and it, it's odd because it makes me feel like a child just playing with them, but it's good. Keeps my brain busy. Keeps my brain busy. Um, so if you're interested, go check them out. Again, shout out to the one and only uh, guys over. I mean, look at all the stretch goals. Jeez. Oh, they even have a glow in the dark one. Oh, that's cool. Well, if they hit the stretch goal, I guess they can do that. But Stymag Series 2, check them out. Links in chat if you are so interested. Again, thank you to them for sponsoring the stream. The Luke Stevens stream. Or Luke Stevens live stream. Um, okay. 
I can close this down. Real quick, fam. Did anybody here play the one and only? The best. Uh, first person magic shooter of last year. I think actually technically the only one. Um, <laughs> technically, I think it was the only magic shooter last year. Immortals of Avium. Did anybody play that? Because we have some unfortunate news uh, for them again, which I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up here in a second. Yeah, Immortals of Avium. Yeah, we have some more unfortunate news. It just keeps getting worse. Uh, Eric, also, I'm not sure if I shouted that one out, but thank you for becoming a member. Bat Family Three, 15 months. Oh baby, thank you. I still don't see how people are complaining about all this when all of the episodic games came out like. Batman Telltale, they didn't complain. Um, oh, that was like 10 minutes ago. I'm not. I'm not sure what that was in reference to. Remind me, Bat Family, what that was in reference to, and I can respond to it. Because I'm not sure off the dome. Uh, Revenge of the Fifth. <laughs> Thank you for six months. Appreciate you, my friend, over on Twitch. And Ivan, thank you for the super chat as well. Do you have an opinion on the rumors about the cancellation of the Dead Space 2 because of poor uh, Dead Space 1 remake sales? Yeah, Jason Schreier came out and like countered with their statement. They're like, oh, none of this story is true. And Jason Schreier came out and said, nope, it is true. They're lying. So I, I think it's all but confirmed at this point. I mean, Jason Schreier doesn't just say stuff. So he's said that... Um, yeah, he said that it's it's pretty much confirmed that they're just stepping away from it. And it's just that the the remake only sold about a million copies. And I know it's like only a million copies, but we're talking like they probably needed two or three million to break even. So if the sales aren't there, it just doesn't make sense. Like modern AAA development is not easy. Like it just isn't, you know, after the, the cuts that these companies take like PlayStation or whatever, even if they're making like 40 bucks a copy, which is generous after taxes and everything, 40 bucks a copy, you know, you sell a million copies, assuming full price, which isn't even a given. They made 40 million in revenue that doesn't factor in marketing, that doesn't factor in you know anything else. It probably cost more like 100 million to, to 200 million to remake that thing. So it just doesn't work. But like, this is the thing. This is the, the tough spot that gaming is in right now where we're all pissed that companies like Ubisoft are putting out $100 versions of their games, right? But nobody wants to buy games at full price because the quality is up in the air and really inconsistent. And uh, studios can't get AA games to sell because people are frustrated they don't have AAA features. And so we're just between a rock and a hard place where studios can't afford to make the games players want. And even when they do try to give players what they're asking for, if the game just doesn't happen to click with everybody, it just loses a hundred million dollars. And that's just not sustainable. It doesn't work. Um, so it doesn't shock me that it didn't turn a profit. Like, unfortunately, it just seems to be like, yep, that's just, it's really, really tough to, to find a way to make that happen. But it's, it's just how it, how it goes. So I'm not surprised by it. I'm still disappointed by it because I would love more remakes and stuff, but to do a remake on the scale that people are hoping for and asking for requires a ton of sales at full price and a lot of people are like no it's a remake it shouldn't be full price to begin with and even then i'll wait till it, it goes on sale and that's the worst thing that gamers or that a, a game developer could hear is i'll wait for a sale that's the worst thing you could tell them because <laughs> these things only really work if they sell two three million copies at full price once they have to start putting it on sale it doesn't really work you know Um, games are also a luxury. A lot of other factors affect being able to buy them at those prices other than quality. Yeah, Ar Arctur. And I mean, that's the other thing is that we're entering a time when people don't really have a lot of expendable income and people are trying to save up for, 
you know, just savings. They're trying to pay off debts that they might have. They're trying to uh, maybe save up to get a house or, or whatever they might be trying to do financially. And spending $70 on a game at launch is a tough sell, especially when they know it's going to go on sale and they'll get it for cheaper. You know, like that's that's the other piece to this. And it's something we brought up with the Ubisoft discussion is these games only work if they sell five to 10 million copies um, with how expensive they are. But when everybody knows that in six months it's going to be 50 percent off, a lot of people just wait for it to go on sale. And then all of a sudden the math breaks. It just doesn't work. So th there's just a problem in the gaming industry right now where games like the games players want are too expensive to produce with the returns that are happening. So either they have to charge more per copy, which gamers will explode if you try to do that. Um, like just imagine if they announced that, I mean, even if they announced The Witcher 4, or a game that somebody's really hyped for, is gonna be $100, not even 70, it's gonna be 100. People will lose their minds. You'll hear people calling for boycotts, calling for all sorts of stuff. People will lose their minds. And, um, but at the same time, players want those, like the games that cost that much. So it's just, we're in a tough spot, but I think we're just going to see a ton of AAA games just disappear. Yeah, brokies. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that we probably just see a, a lot of that where a lot of uh, devs stop putting together these huge games. I don't think we're going to see a lot of third-party publishers putting out triple a sized games anymore we're just gonna see them taking less and less risks so it's the age of the indie i mean but even that indie devs are reporting tons of trouble getting discoverability having people actually discover their games and uh getting people to actually buy them it's very very difficult This is why people are also signing up for the monthly subscriptions, about $20, then cancel it after the first month. Yeah, yeah. And I know that there's discussions of some, some like, regulators that are trying to, um, well, basically, there's some companies that are trying to find ways to prevent that. And I think probably what you'll start to see is companies like Microsoft for Game Pass, they might raise it to, like, $30 a month if you're paying month to month. Or you can pay, like, 140 for a year so it's like way cheaper if you give them all the money up front so you can't just cancel it i think you'll start to see that a lot more and they already kind of do that where it's a slight discount if you buy it in bulk i don't think game pass actually offers annual subscriptions um but i think that you're going to start to see a lot of companies do that because a lot of guys do that i mean they they uh go in there and they sign up for a month and then they cancel it right after you know over the last couple of years, PlayStation Plus has gone from like 50 bucks a month to $80 a month. Yeah, and they're just going to steadily try to walk it all the way up until it gets like $150, $200 a year. Because they're just, all these companies are desperate to find ways to turn a profit. Because you just, you cannot make games on the scale that these games are, for exp as expensive as they are, and sell the number of copies that are currently being sold it just doesn't work the math doesn't work we did that whole stream segment the other day where we broke it down and i just showed you with like napkin math this doesn't make sense the math doesn't math it's like oh yeah no you need to sell like four five six million copies of a game like like star wars outlaws to break even and that's assuming like pretty generous margins on stuff. More likely, you probably need to get closer to like seven, eight, nine, ten million copies sold. That doesn't work. That that just doesn't work. So you're not going to see companies continuing to do it out of the goodness of their heart. They'll just cancel and stop developing those projects, which is what you're already seeing. EA said they're not doing licensed games anymore, except for like Star Wars Jedi Survivor or whatever sequel and some smaller projects like that, but they're just gonna, like they canceled the Mandalorian game. We're seeing uh, big studios like Insomniac struggle to turn a profit, even though they make game of the year contender titles. They, they're they struggling to find any success. And uh, I mean, even Ubisoft, oh, excuse me. 
Even Ubisoft is running into trouble where they are about to put out Star Wars Outlaws and they've already said, no, we're not making a sequel. This team is going right back to the division right after it because the margins are just too tight. It just doesn't work. So. Yeah. But anyway, bringing it all back to this, this is kind of topical. Immortals of Avium Studio has reportedly furloughed the majority of its staff. Last year, of course, after the game dropped, they reportedly laid off about half of the studio. Um, it wasn't very large. I think it was like 100 and something developers. So, you know, it wasn't a crazy number of, of people, but still it's half of the whole studio. So um, according to a LinkedIn post by former employee Chris Mornis, which has been corroborated by Polygon reporter Nicole Carpenter, quote, Ascendant Studios has furloughed the majority of their staff. Um, said Mornas, who left the studio last summer to join Phoenix Labs. I can't imagine what that would be like, as that is worse than getting laid off. Furlough is basically just an imposed leave of absence from work, which is typically unpaid. While employees typically, or rather technically, keep their jobs and are expected to return to work at some point, it means that they don't qualify for things like severance pay. Carpenter said, quote, this lines up with what I've heard at Immortals of Avium Developer Ascendant Studios that a large portion of the staff was recently furloughed. Haven't been able to confirm the numbers. Whoops. Haven't been able to confirm the numbers, and Ascendant hasn't responded to multiple requests for comment. Which, basically, what this would suggest to me is that they probably are shopping a concept around either for another game or they are trying to find some creative ways maybe to sell as a studio they're just trying to search for something they can do and it's all up in the air right now so rather than having the team in the studio working on a game they don't know if they can pay for they are just going to put them on furlough basically send them home without pay and say okay fam we'll hopefully get together soon and hopefully we have some good news but until then we're just Kind of sitting on our hands, waiting to find out what's next. And that's that's that. Their de debut game, EA published Immortals of Avium, was released last August. Yeah, they dropped it right next to Baldur's Gate 3. Didn't end up going too hot. The following month, Ascendant laid off nearly half of its staff, with its CEO, Brett Robbins, later saying the move was down to poor sales during a crowded release window. And, I mean, they've, they've tried pretty desperately to gen like r rustle up some level of interest in this game and it just has not worked um they've really really tried but like we've looked at this all-time peak on launch week on launch day 751 players bear in mind this was a 125 dollar or $125 million game. They spent $80 million developing it and about $40 million marketing it. And they peaked at 750 players. And like, they they realized, I mean, th there were interviews after the fact where they were like, yeah, looking back, doing a AAA shooter as our first game didn't really work. Didn't make a lot of sense. I think they did a Mr. Beast collaboration where they paid Mr. Beast to promote the game and it saw like a very slight bump of like a few hundred players. And then it kind of mellowed out after that. But like they tried desperately to get people interested in this game. It just did not work. Players just weren't that interested. It's just crazy. But I played the game. I thought it had potential. I thought there was some really weird writing. There was a lot of like kind of cringe stuff where it just was unnecessarily strange they had characters they thought uh, you could tell how they were writing it that they thought players were going to find this character super funny and likable and it, they were just the most annoying character on earth like it, it was so frustrating um other kind of odd things were like the characters all referred to anybody in any sort of leadership position as sir so i thought it was like a glitch the first time i heard it where they were talking like the main character is talking to his like leader who's uh, a woman in this like leadership position 
and he kept calling her sir. And I thought it was like a messed up line or maybe the character was originally a guy because sir is a masculine title. And it's like, no, that's just in this universe they call leadership in, in the military positions, sir. I was like, okay. But like, why did, like, just why though? <laughs> you know, like, it was just one of those things where it's like, but you, like, it was just, it hit the ear weird. And, um, I, wa like, I went to a preview event for it and somebody actually asked the question cause they thought they heard it too. And they thought it was like a, a, a glitch or something. And the, the problem with these things is like, if there is anything that sticks out, it's just a speed bump. Like, yeah, I think in, in real life, they do that in certain military contexts, but to gamers, like to casual gamers, it just hits the ear weird. And so people ask the question and it's like that right there was just another speed bump you gave when it just like, you didn't even have to, uh, to, to have any dialogue that frustrated anybody, you know, like it's just, there were many little things like that where it was just another speed bump that was a little bit frustrating or a little bit confusing. Um, I'm in the military. I can confirm they don't do that. It's sir or ma'am. Yeah. I see that. I, obviously not in the military, but, uh, I, to, to me, it was just like, you just had an instance where somebody brought this up, thought that it was a, a mistake and whether people think it's a mistake or, or whether it is a mistake or not, if people think it's a mistake, it probably is a mistake. Like it's just another issue. It, it goes back to the thing of, you know, uh, perception is reality. If people think that there's something wrong with the game, if people think that there's a mistake in the writing, if people think that there was an, a, a mistake with how the dialogue played off, it probably is a mistake, whether it was intentional or not. You should deal with it as a mistake because people have that impression, you know? And, and that's where, that's where, um, I think it's tougher to understand how it could still be a, a problem. Yeah. It's S E R S Y R for women and male knights. Sure. Like the, I, I think there was a very valid reason and to be clear, it's a, a world and a universe in which there is magic and dragons and stuff. So if they wanted to call them, yes, Bapupi, respectfully, Bapupi, I will follow your orders. That would be fine. But it's just, it hits players ears and they think it is a mistake. Like they hear it as a mistake. So you should treat it like that. Because everybody heard that and was like, okay, well, that, so was that like a glitch? You know, it, it just... There were a lot of little things like that where I was like, did they just not like play test it? Did they not get feedback or anything? And it would have been easy to, uh, to fix, you know, have one person from outside the studio come in and just be like, yeah, that sounds like it's a glitch or it sounds like the character is supposed to be male or something. Cause that's just in common, common parlance, how it works is, uh, you know, it's a masculine term S I R sir. So it, it sounds masculine. So when there's a, a feminine character that we're referring to in that way, it sounds like there was some mistake or something. Um, it's just the English, English language. Like it's not that complicated. Um, anyway, they teach in fantasy writing that you shouldn't go crazy since fantasy is already going to be alien to the reader. So you need to use anchors to keep them grounded. I think I've heard that where it's like, you can go crazy. You can write anything, but you shouldn't go too crazy. Otherwise people are just going to disconnect. Like you, you can't go too crazy. Yeah. Um, where's financial Friday? I guess it is Friday. That's a good point. We can bring that up at the very end. We'll bring that up at the very end. We can do that. In this world, legs are arms and arms are legs. Yeah. It's like, well, but why? <laughs> Can I ask why though, please? So 
Anyway, it's it's really unfortunate for Immortals of Avium to hear that the studio has just kind of imploded at this point. Uh, because I think there's a ton of talent there. I mean, they they clearly put together a, a very impressive package in a, an Unreal Engine 5. I don't know what I, I was trying to find a way to, to describe it. It's a it's a beautifully impressive burrito wrapped up in an Unreal Engine 5 tortilla. There we go. And there's clearly a ton of talent there. But it just was a game that nobody was really that interested in. It also was a magical kind of game about a magical like cuff that you would wear that was like served as the conduit for firing magical weapons and stuff. And it came out at a time like after Forspoken did the magical cuff thing. And then there was uh, Atlas Fallen, which also had a magical cuff. So it seemed very samey to all of those even though these were in development for years it just happened to drop next to all of these other ones and on top of all of that like it just didn't really stand out it didn't do anything super unique that was really exciting and even when they showed gameplay it was it was a lot of flash but not many people saw a lot of substance you know we didn't see any really cool gameplay stuff it just looked like yeah you basically have a shotgun basically a rifle and then like an automatic machine gun type of magic that you can fire. And like, that was basically it. That was basically it. And so it just didn't stand out much. Yeah. No more sarcastic magical cuffs. Yeah. You better believe nobody's going to be do ma doing magical cuffs in the next decade. <laughs> nobody's touching that with a 10 foot pole. I don't know what it was like that that inspired these studios from all around the world to do very similar things all at the same time but it's damn funny because it all these games dropped within like six months of each other and we're just <laughs> they all shared the same thing it was really weird um let's see shinji i'm going to be honest immortals of avium's flashy sparkly bs reminded me of forespoken and since i didn't like that one i avoided this too yeah and i i think that that's the danger with being similar to other titles is if the other titles are really awesome and you know people loved them that could help you like if you have a game that looks very reminiscent of Baldur's Gate 3 and it launches six months after Baldur's Gate that could actually help you because people are like wow I need another Baldur's Gate fix I'm gonna go play this because it's similar but if it sucks it's gonna drag you down with it and I, I just think that that's what happened here and more than anything from what I could tell and from what I saw people just flatly weren't interested there just wasn't anything that captivating. They spent tons of money on trailers. They spent tons of money on YouTuber impression videos and streamers playing it. Like they did everything by the book, but gamers just weren't interested. They just weren't. And it doesn't matter if you have the, all the millions in the world. It just doesn't matter. You know? The two to three hour tutorial of Forspoken killed the game more than any gameplay or cuff or weird writing. I think more than anything, it was the demo and the fact that the writing in the intro hour was so freaking bad that it was easy for streamers to boot up, play it for an hour or two, make tons of viral videos and clips that showed how terrible it was and leave it there. Like um, how I actually found my my short form content editor. Uh, let's see. was uh from this so <laughs> streamers can't take four spoken's dialogue seriously all of the footage in this video is from like within the first hour or two okay so it made it really easy for streamers to pop in try the game and be like oh my god this is so bad whereas if this footage were much later if this footage was like 6 10 20 hours in would have been much harder to make these videos at launch but because the writing was so terrible from the get-go it was really easy for this stuff to go viral oh i saw this clip on twitter I just oh, yucky. Well, oh and here's that dialogue that went viral i did not just do Something i do now i do magic talk to sentient cuffs kill jacked up beasts <laughs> this is heckin awesome yeah, okay that is something i do now <laughs> heckin awesome dude whoa well, excited for forespoken for are you well, Papa Squat. I've, uh, I've, I've... I love my cats. 
dearly. But yesterday, Finley went and scratched up the carpet on the landing of these stairs. And then he peed on the spot he dug up and tore up. And I know he peed because for one, it smelled weird. But I also have this like UV flashlight I use for helping cure resin when I 3D print stuff like, like this. Um, and it also is good because it's basically a black light and it can scan and show spots where cats peed. And I, I shined it there and sure enough, like a big old spot where he tore up the carpet and peed. I don't know what his deal is. Like he, well, I do know what his deal is. He throws a fit. He's a very cute cat. I love him dearly. Don't get me wrong. But he will just pee on things to throw a fit about something. So like if he's upset that the neighbors are having lawn work done and it's really loud because they have like uh, an aerator or something going. If he's just upset that it's too loud and he can't sleep because it's too loud, this cat will just claw stuff up and pee on stuff. <laughs> like... <laughs> he's he's a vindictive little bugger. I'll tell you what. It drives me crazy. Um, Hermione will will act out if she thinks, like, if she, her food got shut off or something, which I actually appreciate because I'm like, okay, yeah, you scratched at the couch, but it's because you knocked over your, your water bowl or something and you need me to fix it. Like, okay, at least you have a way of telling me, right? Finley will do it just to be a little butthead where he's just like, I'm upset. Yeah. <laughs> I'll pee here just to show you I'm the boss, you know, drives me a little bit crazy. Um, yeah, I'm braced, dude. I, the, the word, okay. I'm about to complain in, in first world problems. Okay. Just be ready. Okay. Then we're going to, we're going to get into this. Um, my house, it has relatively newer floors and carpets. Okay. Probably within the last like year and a half, two years. I think they replaced them right before they sold the house which is great cool right no problems what's the problem though because there are problems well we have uh it looks like two layers of floors all upstairs where they laid down the replacement floor on top of the old floor without replacing it so it's not even really a replacement floor it's just top floor and so now if i ever want to replace it I have to tear up two layers of flooring and like the subfloor and everything and then go and I have to install new flooring and then all of the trim and baseboards are going to have to be removed and reinstalled like a half inch lower. And because this is also done in my kitchen, I'm going to have to like if I ever want to replace the dishwasher, I've got to tear up all the floors. Because the the flooring is like a half an inch above the actual bottom of of where the the washer's installed. So the washer dishwasher is installed like a half inch lower than the floor. So you can't actually pull it out from the like quartz countertops and stuff. Drives me crazy. You must have been a <clears throat> floored. <laughs> yes, uh, it drove me a little crazy. So when I realized that. I was like, oh my God. And now the cats are like clawing at it. Finley's peeing on the carpet and stuff. So I'm like, if I'm going to do the floors, I just need to do the floors, right? I just have to do it. But damn, dude, it's going to be like $20,000. It's going to be a lot. Call the company that built the house or an inspector and have them re replace that. The problem is that the the guy that most likely did it was like a handyman that the previous guy that owned this house used because the guy that used to own this house was like an investor. So he owned like, like 15 houses in this neighborhood or something. So he had a handyman. He would have do all of his work and the handyman would go through and do quick kind of easy fixes on stuff. And he knew he was selling this house. So he went in and did some quick fixes on stuff and we caught some of them during inspection. You know, we got, like tens of thousands of dollars off this house. I told you guys about the sewer line where we wanted, um, we, I had the sewer scoped and we found a belly in the, the sewer line. 
So I got them to pay to replace a $28,000 sewer line and they had to replace it before the deal closed. So thankfully we don't have to pay for that because we got that done as part of the deal. So we got tens of thousands of dollars of stuff done before we moved in. But um, the floors are like the one thing where we were like, okay, we can deal with this. We can put up with it. But now I'm like, if I have to replace these carpets because the cats are peeing on stuff and I just want to do like the same, maybe hardwood floors through the whole house, it's going to be tens of thousands of dollars. Like it's going to be insane. So yeah. Handyman is landlord code for cheap labor with no experience. Yeah. Yeah. No. And there's all sorts of things that the guy did in this house where I was like, you really made it more difficult on yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, Brian, I just realized calling someone thick in Ireland is a different meaning than the U S it means dumb in Ireland. My bad. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're like, Ooh, that, like, <laughs> Oh, wow. That, that handyman's thick. Oh yeah. Yeah. Here that has a different context. Um, yeah. Then cutting quarters like that is going to cause your flares to rot onto the carpet and ruin the carpet. They need to replace it on their expense. Yeah. The, the issue is in the, uh, I could potentially hire a lawyer, go after them because they did not disclose the floor problems to us on the there's a form you fill out when you buy a house called the seller's disclosure um where the seller has to fill in all of the stuff he knows about the house but here's where he's got something kind of built in because he's an investor and he never lived here he has a built-in get out of jail free card because he can just say i wasn't aware of the floors because i didn't live there and i have so many properties that my my teams were working on stuff and i didn't realize that they did that incorrectly i didn't have knowledge of it so i didn't disclose it cuz i could go after them and saying that you didn't disclose this and because i wasn't informed of it i feel entitled to the compensation to fix it but he has that built-in excuse not to mention it's going to take yeah i think he, i mean obviously he knew uh, there's no way he didn't know but in court, he has a much easier argument to make than I do because I have, I'd have to prove that he knew and that also he knew that by withholding the information from me, he was saving himself tons of money and all that. Uh, and all of this is just compounded on top of the, the crap sandwich that is the fact that if I want to do all of that, my legal fees will be more than just replacing the damn floor. So at that point, just replace the damn floor. Like I, I could be like, oh, well, it's about the principle of the thing. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Like if I'm just trying to get the damn floors replaced, I will spend more money going after him and still maybe not get the floors done than if I just went and did the floors. It's covered by the losing party. Yeah, but it's not a guarantee that you'll win, which is the, the poopy bit. I said I was gonna play Speaking of poopy bits. <laughs> people saying the dialogue is heckin' awesome. Other people say it's freaking great. We're gonna play it and we're gonna see for ourselves. Or spoken. Here we go. From there, let's just jump right into it with new game. Let's see what we got. Here we go. Everyone has something they're willing to fight for. Could be family. Friends. Anime girls. Your beliefs. But what do you do when the world fights back? That's not the sound those kinds of shoes make. Now. So what, was she in court? She going to jail? Oh yeah, that was un like that was irrationally triggering to me. She's wearing like white sneakers. Friends. Anime girls. And but what like those are sneakers, and yet they're making sound like wood sold shoes. Like that's not how that works. like at all <laughs> and it shouldn't be triggering but it is i found a pair of uh what are, what are they they're meslin dubai edition shoes i found them at a thrift store one day it was part of like an estate sale some dude had these like 800 dollars shoes and they were in his closet he died they took him to the thrift store and i bought them for like 15 dollars or something and they somehow fit and they're beautiful shoes. I mean, these things are incredible and they have wooden soles 
And so when you step on a granite or like tile floor like this, it makes that clippity clop sound and it's awesome. It makes you feel like an aristocrat from the 15th century. It's awesome. And that's the sound that is happening on screen here or in this video. She's wearing white sneakers and they're playing the same thing. It's crazy. It drives me insane. What do you do when the world fights back? That's not the sound those kinds yes, of shoes make. Now. So what, was she in court? She going to jail? She's charged with attempted grand larceny. How do you plead? Not guilty, Your Honor. Oh, dude, it's so cringy. I see. Officer, please remove her cuffs. Oh, that was easy. Bulletproof defense. Now, perhaps you should reacquaint yourself with your many previous encounters with the law. What? Oh, you want me to defend myself? Read the document on the left, uh, the one in the middle, the one on the right. Read the document on the left. As you can see here, I went to high school. <laughs> <laughs> a picture for reading. I rest my case, Your Honor. Diploma, okay. Haven't seen this in a while. What do you mean? You graduated two years ago. You said you're 20. You have two previous felony thefts. And with this new one, your grand total will be three. What's she stealing for? This could put you away for a very, very long time. You have so much potential. I, I, I can do so much more with my life. I I I'm a smart girl with a bright future. I was going to say you have so much anger and resentment. Who tells somebody hurts. they have a bright future? I I'm a smart girl with a bright future. Yeah. I never said you that. So Easy now. <laughs> you. I'm not sure you have so much anger and resentment in you. I'm not sure you'll ever amount to anything at all. <laughs> Damn. True slapped. Hurts. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I cannot think of a time, any time where it would be considered appropriate for you to tell a judge, I have a bright future, let me off. <laughs> like, it's crazy, dude. <laughs> I'm slapped. But I'm going to give you an early present. I'm going to release you under the condition you serve 120 hours of community service. That's a lot. You can't do that, that's not fair. I, I don't like helping people, Next no. Time you end up in front of me, oh God, no, just send me to jail. 120 hours of community service. Okay, that's not Thanks. bad. Okay. That was close. That judge might have just saved my ass. Time to go steal I something. I don't think they will, but it'd be really good to go from here after hey, a goddamn like me. theft Your phone. encounter oh right back to stealing. Thank you so much. No worries. Happens to all of us. Happy holidays. It's also the like slightly dead eyes that really is the cherry on top here. I'll tell you what. Really is. You can't steal a phone like that. They track it. I should get back to Homer. Poor girl needs her dinner. Hello? Oh, dude, I forgot about this. The, like, Pepsi commercial, very diverse group of thugs that come up to rob her and... Uh-oh. Oh, dude, I forgot about this. Uh, Damn. Hey. Hey, uh, okay, what kind of mugger is uh, dressed like this, though? Lisa! You don't really look like a Lisa. <laughs> Oh, where is Sorry, it? Sorry, it's not funny. It's, oh, it's don't assault. Have it, right? There it's were complications. Funny. Jesus. Get the car. Back. <laughs> Keep joking. <laughs> the music immediately starts. <laughs> I, dude, I forgot Why did the this. music kick on like that? <laughs> well, the gun comes out, the music sounds. I can't hear you over the orchestra. Talk louder, Fred. All right, get, get, quick, get, 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 quick, gig. I, I just tell him for now. Here's some collateral. <sighs> Parkinson. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah, right. Crazy. <laughs> like, where did she get the handful of dirt? Oh, hello, dude. Hi. You want to say hi to everybody? Hi. You say hi? I'm really grouchy today. You're really grouchy? Oh, that's not Michael, okay. This is face he already meant. Oh, you you want to just say hi to everybody? Hi, everybody. I'm going to eat some lunch. Ooh. <laughs> Both he and Lachlan have matching mohawks today. Oh, good. I got lots of comments from the older oh. ladies in the oh. store. Oh, yeah. They're like, wow, those are some handsome those babies. Those are some handsome babies. A lot of, like, grandpas, too. They always stop and they're like, oh, that's a sick haircut. And then they look at the other one and they're like, oh my gosh, that's a sweet haircut too. Huh. These are bite sides and I don't think you should play with them. Well, I just brought groceries in and Lucky keeps picking grapes saying he's picking blueberries. <laughs> 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 <Go ahead. laughs> 
That's pretty cute. <laughs> Mom, look, a blueberry. A blueberry. They're oh, grapes, it's, babe. It's a grape. Do you think they can cut strawberries to give you some drinks? For the sweet flowers? Eh, probably not. We'll get kind of soggy, I bet. Well, that's a little strawberry. It's nice. I mean, it's probably fine if it's going in like a fruit salad. Yeah, but it's a fruit salad. Yeah. It's, it's like probably strawberries, fine. Strawberries, grapes, and blackberries. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Yeah, he's a he's a good fella. He's a good fella. No! Okay, just a couple more minutes. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, right. There's no way they ain't gonna. How'd she get away like that? They have a gun too. They could just shoot her now. <laughs> like. I mean, they can still just shoot you. It's a it's just a chain link fence. And then she just parkoured her way through all of this. What the? F they forgot they had. She a gun. had a gun pointed at her. Neck. No turning back now. Okay. How they not see her? She's right there. Oh damn! She threw dirt in his face. Where is she getting this dirt to throw at people? <laughs> she didn't pick any up. She just had a fistful of dirt. <laughs> I do like the idea that canonically she's just running around with pockets full of dirt, just in case, you know. Jump <laughs> parkour off of him. Fucking ladies, Jackie Chan. They, they better explain that she trained with Jackie Chan. Wait, isn't he coming? Like, it, bro, you tell me he can't jump up and check. Bro, I'd be up that in a second. Yeah, right. That dude couldn't get that. Get up there. Ah! Where'd she go? We will find you, Frank. You will burn. All right then. Dude, the whole thing is just so bad. Where's the, the famous line? Like when she gets the cuff. Oh, it's right here. Whoa! Shit! Whoa! What the f Defeat the mo- Okay. Magic missile. 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 Take this. And then some of this. Ah. Missile. Missile, 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 missile. Okay. Did I just do that? Well, oh, and here's we that dialogue that went viral. I did not just do that. We did. Let's just sit back and enjoy I just moved shit with my mind. Perhaps our connection has somehow awoken some abilities. Oh, I saw this clip on Twitter. I just oh, moved yucky. shit with my mind. That is something I do now. I do magic, talk sentient cuffs, kill jacked up beasts. You know what? I'll probably fly next. Now you're just being ridiculous. Oh, that's too far. Good to know there was a line. If you could just master these new abilities. Um, did you not just can, see me? Can everyone go? Gnarly beast? <laughs> Well, yeah, that's it's pretty bad. It's not helped by the fact that the lip syncing is also just a little off. This hundred percent a boss fight area, hundred percent. Yeah, dude, everybody just so dead in the face. It's just crazy. It's crazy. But bear in mind, this game, by all accounts, cost on the same scale as like Final Fantasy sixteen. Like they spent hundreds of millions of dollars on this and it is a huge game i mean there's a lot to forespoken um i was talking to Joe raptor about it on the podcast once and he had an interesting thought like he basically came and said that well it's it's um if you can overlook the the kind of writing that isn't great there's actually a really solid game there there's some really cool boss fights and stuff and some cool combat I played it. I don't remember how many hours I put in, but I, I played a good a good bit of it. Um, and then I played the DLC as well. And for me, it just never got to the point where I was like, this is worth putting up with terrible writing. Like it just, it never got there. It, it never got there. And so I can't put up with it. Some people can just turn their brain off and they can just tolerate the cringe and handle it. I just don't have that superpower. I I hear it and it like turns me off. <laughs> I, I like shut down, but some people are able to just kind of turn their brain off and it's like, oh, well, whatever, you know, <laughs> born of tungsten. Jor is just chronically positive. Um, I think it's just Jor is, is a glasses half full kind of guy, which is one of the reasons I love talking with him and chatting with him. Um, just because he, he always has a different perspective that I can appreciate, but I just, 
it, it, something like that to me, I just can't look past, you know, the Marvel speak is so tiring these days, dude, for real. And that's what that is. I mean, it's just, you can tell that they were like, yeah. And then maybe just ad lib a little bit, just riff a little bit, have some cool banter, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, you know? He likes Suicide Squad. What Joel Raptor said about Suicide Squad was that he thought at a certain price point, it would be worth it because there were some good things about it, but it was not worth $70. And I technically agree with him. I think at like 10, 20 bucks, maybe, especially as later seasons come in. If you could play through the whole game with Joker, for example, I could see it maybe being worth um, like 20 bucks or something. You just have to understand that you're going to get like three hours of content and then stretch that over 10 hours. Like that's, that's where, what you'll be getting. And, uh, in that context, I mean, I, I think that that could make sense, but I, I do know some people took him out of context and clipped it and were like, Oh my God, see Joe Raptor loved it. He didn't love it. He just thought it's at a certain price point. It could make sense. Plays the Joker, baby. <laughs> I'm the Joker, baby. Oh man. I, I was going to see if I still had that clip. I don't have the Tommy Wiseau. Ha ha ha. Joker. <laughs> I wish I had that pulled up already. Damn it. MCO ironic dialogue needs to end. Yeah. It, it's just this like, Ooh, yeah, we're so impromptu. We'll just w like wittily banter back and forth and like improvise some lines and it'll be so quirky and funny and very few actors and actresses can pull that off. And even then it, it it's very easy for it to become cringy. Very, very easy for it to become cringy. So it's probably best to just avoid it. But some people, some devs just think, well, it worked for Marvel. Let's just do that. You know, just trying to be crazy. Okay, you're right. We should play that out of respect. Out of respect. Here it is. Uh, Hi, this is Tommy Wiseau, creator of The Room. Let me introduce you to the new Joker. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I wasn't ready for that. Ah! Ah! Yeah, we roll. Tommy Joker tape, tape two, two kilo. What doesn't kill you make you stranger. <laughs> Ah, Joker. <laughs> Joker. Oh, but I did, and I did like it. That little. I am not the monster. No, I'm just the head of the curve. He has come to me. Come on, I'm not the monster. No. Why? So serious? Why? So What's funny is if they did this, and if this was the Joker, I guarantee you season one would have been very successful. If they had a couple of cutscenes with Tommy Wiseau acting as the Joker, it would have been successful. Like, I think it would have gone viral. Every big streamer would have been loading in to, to try the latest update of Suicide Squad. Like, I really think it would have blown up. Of course, they didn't do that. Instead, we got like wish.com angsty teenager joker. Uh, but man, it would have been so amazing. Can you just imagine if you're playing Suicide Squad, Kill the Justice League, and just randomly in combat? Ha ha! Joker. So serious. Why so serious? Let's put a smile on this face. Why so serious? Jingle bells, <laughs> Batman smell. Action. Bang. <laughs> ah. Oh my God, dude. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. Bang. <laughs> bell. Action. Bang. Ah. A little click. Oh, oh man. 
I need him. Where is he? Where is the Batman? Where is... Okay, look, stand right here, like this. You're not the Batman, get out! I need Batman, where is he? Oh, hi, Mark. I'm Batman. I'm a Batman. Why do you want to kill me? I don't want to kill you. I need you. Why should I kill you? Why? Why should I kill you? I don't want to kill you because you complete me. Yes, I need you. You'll be in a pen cell for. <laughs> like, come on. This would have been amazing. Oh. But it just goes to show you, like, there are, there are solutions. It's like, what would you have changed, Luke, to make Suicide Squad kill the Justice League successful? Honestly, not taking itself super seriously and just leaning into meme culture, that would do a ton to, to lift its image. Um, seriously, like, if they had had Tommy Wiseau as the Joker, unironically, I think it actually could have have helped the game a lot <laughs> which is hilarious to say but uh i i really do think that that would have brought some levity and honestly if people aren't going to play it because it's a really good game maybe get them to play it for the memes and this would have been a great way to do it i really do believe it what doesn't kill you makes you a stranger <laughs> joker my favorite one is the uh, is the gun though. This. <laughs> Bang. Bang. It's <laughs> just so good, dude. Oh man. Ah. Oh. Um yeah, one of Suicide Squad's many problems is that it takes itself too seriously most of the time. Well, but then it also, like, it has a tonal problem. And so, like, they have Boomerang pissing on the bodies of Justice League members, which is, like, really jarring and does not feel appropriate or fitting at all. But then, like, Harley will have these really dramatic speeches against the Batman um, before she shoots him. And then there's other stuff where, like, you can tell that they're really feeling it very intensely. And then there's other parts that just stand out and stick out like a sore thumb. But I think if they were to come along and have somebody just totally wacky and crazy like this, it could have actually helped it unify a little bit more and feel less disjointed. Bang. Ah. <laughs> I just can't get over the little click. <laughs> oh, man. Oh. Uh. Man, oh, it's so funny. It's just so funny. I can't. Um, let's see. Da -da 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 -da. Oh, we did mention that one. A uh, proto, thank you. 15 months. Gee whiz. 15 min months. Bang. <laughs> Bang goes the, the membership. And. Uh, Reddit lists. Thank you for resubbing with Prime. Three months. Ooh, baby. Um, let's see. Off topic, just a quick question. Do you know if it's possible to link a YouTube channel under the main channel section to an account you do not own? I think so. Under, like, it would be under, um... Like there's, there's something where it's like recommended channels or friendly channels. There's something like that in the, the settings for your channel page. So I think there is a way to do it. It wouldn't be under the like official links for your channel, but I do think there is a way to do that. I think. Bang. Bang. So. Yeah, I think so. Um. Ba 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 ba. Oh yeah. Sea of Thieves. Sea of Thieves beta has launched on PS5. They can sample it until April 15th. Interesting. Is there anybody in chat who is currently in the beta? Do you know how it works or if it works? Is anybody in chat? 
please, for the love of God, make that the dono sound. Bang! <laughs> I could probably do that. I could probably do that. Oh, man. Bang! No, I don't think so. Okay. That's okay. It's a very niche thing. But high volume of new players, which may result in longer wait times, normal, da, 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 until April 15th. Ugh. It seems like they, they actually are getting some, some interest in it. So there's that. That's a thing. That's a thing. Bang. Okay. We should touch on this real quick because this also dropped out of nowhere. So after, I guess, new segment. Bang. So some of you guys have been with me waiting on news for the Fallout 4 next gen update because this was announced like last year that they were working on. Well, it was announced a while back, but they have been very, very quiet on it, which was odd because like we knew the Fallout show was coming and it just seemed to line up like, oh, yeah, drop the next gen update right when you drop the show and you'll get people to download the game for the first time or maybe re-download it and try it after they try the show and are really loving it. Uh, but for whatever reason, they were just very quiet on it. And then the show dropped and then they announced that the update is coming, not immediately, but it's coming in a couple of weeks. Specifically, this is being referred to as the next gen upgrade for Fallout 4. It's been delayed a ton. It was scheduled to arrive last year but they've described it as featuring performance and quality mode settings it will also be a native app on the ps5 and xbox series x and s meaning it won't show up as like a ps4 game or as an xbox series x or s game it will actually or uh, an xbox one game rather it will show up as a native game on the new consoles which is nice if you care about that type of thing. They also say that it will allow you to experience up to 60 FPS and increased resolution. My understanding though, correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that this is already possible with the Series X. So with like the backwards compatibility thing. So I don't know if this is that useful for Xbox players, but it seems like mainly an update that really helps PlayStation players more than anything else. Um, they also say players on PS4 and Xbox One will receive a free update with stability improvements, login, and quest fixes. So they're also getting boosts. And PC players will receive a free update, which includes widescreen and ultra widescreen support, as well as fixes to the Creation Engine kit. The game will be available um, and will be Steam Deck verified as well, which is cool. That's a, that's a thing. Fallout 4 will also be released on the Epic Game Store at this time. I guess while you're doing it, why not? Doesn't hurt. Just drop it there too. Because why not? Amazon's Fallout live action show premiered this week. Blah, blah, blah. Yep. Um, Variety recently reported that filming for the second season will see production move to California as part of a tax incentive. The California Film Commission announced this week that it awarded $152 million in tax incentives to multiple shows, with Fallout being the largest. The show's first season, which stars Ella Purnell, Walter, or Walton Goggins, and Aaron Moten, was shot mostly in New York, with some additional film taking place in, uh, or filming taking place in Utah. Seems to make sense, like California, nice and easy. It's amazing to me, and it's always fascinating how, like, the budgets determine so much of how what like what these shows end up being, um, even how they write them, the settings that they choose and stuff. Just because filming in a certain location could be prohibitively expensive, so they choose to instead film in these locations or over there, um, you know, even a country away. What well, I, I think it was a it was like Vancouver, wasn't Psych? The show, I think a lot of Psych was filmed in Vancouver, if I recall the interviews right. It's been years since I heard them. But I think they said that Psych was filmed a lot in Vancouver because it was so much cheaper than trying to film actually in, like, Santa Barbara, where the show was set, which is really interesting. Georgia's really popular. Yeah, Georgia, I think they said Arizona's exploding as well. Um, some stuff, stuff in northern Texas. Wasn't The Last of Us filmed in Canada? Yeah, I think a lot of it was filmed in Canada. There's just a lot of tax incentives. Like uh, some cities will ask for shows to 
come and film in their their locations and in their cities to bring whether it's tourists or just to bring business in and so they'll offer tax incentives and stuff um i think the famous story was that the sequence in rocky where they're like he's doing the training montage jogging around the city and everything that was actually filmed in like an afternoon because they didn't have all of the permits they needed to film. So they ran around and they like filmed out the back of a van because the teamsters, if they were to find out because everything was like unionized very heavily, if they were to find out that they were filming, they'd get in tons of trouble. So they just kind of ran around and chased Sylvester Stallone filming as they could manage it um, through the city. But that's just kind of what you had to do, which is always kind of funny. There's so much like that and so much drama that goes on in the background. It's always fascinating to me. You would just think, oh, well, it's it's a show or a movie. Film it in Hollywood. Nice and easy. But it's not that simple. It really isn't that simple. Cape Town, popular. Uh, New Orleans and Louisiana is getting popular. Yeah, I think just a lot of places are trying to find areas outside of California. Because California became so popular, so there were tons of like uh, new rules and like regulations put in place, and then unions had all sorts of rules for it. And for these companies, they're trying to find ways to save money and produce shows for cheaper, so they'll go elsewhere if they need to. And it even is doubled down. Like one of the things I learned in college when I was doing that, like professional actor prep, is what the class was called. And uh, that's the same class where we met with Sharon Bialy. And it was it was really interesting because they were describing in that class how the extras and stuff for some of these shows can be very, very prohibitively expensive or difficult to find. So when they travel out of state and they film out of state, like Georgia, wherever, they can hire extras in those locations or if they don't hire them they'll just recruit people randomly for free basically to just be in a movie so i think the famous example was in the hunger games when they were collecting extras to play like the other potential recruits or or volunteers or tributes they just put out like a couple of cattle calls asking people in the community in that city that they were filming hey if you want to be in a movie come and uh come and bring your your ID or whatever and uh, we'll provide you costumes and food and you can just be in a movie nice and easy so a bunch of kids showed up because who wouldn't want to be in a movie and they got a bunch of free extras for it which is really really funny uh that that's how it works it's crazy um yeah the cost for locations and permits in Los Angeles is crazy yeah Mia Mia is out there and I'm, I'm sure it's just crazy it's insane um yeah no it's it's outrageous did those extras get credits i mean i don't think i don't think they give every extra in a movie like credits in the rolling credits at the end of the movie and it's probably it's probably like an actual stipulation where it's like yeah you agree that you're not you're not gonna do that one of them being charlie most critical if i remember correctly i mean i guess we can google it uh, moist, critical, hunger games. Uh, let's see, is this it? Tons of questions about the magazine pick my parents framed from my small part in hunger games. Here it is back of my head in all its glory. Is this him? Is it back of my head? So like, is this, is that him? I mean, that's pretty funny. (laughs) But like, there's so many people in this shot. I don't think all of these people are getting in the credits of the movie, but it's still cool to be in a movie if you can manage it, you know? Yeah, such a good actor. You can't even tell. Yeah. Yeah, when he had short hair, look at the spongy (laughs) <laughs> yeah oh, it's, it's super cool it's super cool you know youtube will probably well in twitch chat might also ban the link if you try to post one because of the auto mod stuff um 
let's see. Electronics. Asmund Gold says that games get so expensive because they have to be designed to cater to larger audiences, so much so that gameplay becomes bland and uninteresting. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely part of it. But it's the chicken and the egg thing. Like, are games so expensive because they're trying to cater to everybody? Or are they trying to cater to everybody because games are so expensive? And the answer is yes. <laughs> it's kind of both. Um, it's just because these studios and companies are used to making like AAA scale games. And as time has gone by, they've learned that if, or like, if we want to be successful, if we want to sell AAA size games, we have to find ways to, um, like we, we have to find ways to appeal to broader groups of people and sell more copies. So to do that, we have to put in all of these different systems that appeal to everybody. And it's just. It, it spins and spins and spins. Yeah. I was in a movie, but I filmed it on my phone and you guys can't see it. <laughs> I don't want, I, I don't want to, sh you guys can't see it. It's, it's a, it's an art piece, a secret, a secret art piece. That I'm not going to share. <laughs> How does FromSoft do it? FromSoft, I mean, it's easy to look at, and this is kind of the the fallacy I think a lot of people make, unfortunately, is that it's easy to look at one of the most exceptional developers in the industry and then extrapolate from there that everybody should be capable of that. And I don't necessarily think that that's the case. Like, the reason why FromSoft is such an exceptional studio is because they're just that. They are an exception to the rule. They are able to make games relatively quickly because they're very iterative. They change some like large chunks of their games, but a lot of their games follow the same premises as the previous ones. A lot of them share the same systems, same animations. Like you remember the scandal when they first announced Elden Ring, people were throwing fits because they shared the same like running animations and stuff as Dark Souls 3. Everybody's like, look, they just recycled it. It's like, yeah, that's why they were able to make this game pretty quickly and cheaply comparatively to other big projects. So there's that also from software, uh, apparently from some reporting we've talked about before on stream, they are not exactly the highest paying studio in Japan even. So um, I think it was, let me try to see if I can find the article. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Elden Ring developers compare working at From Software to playing Dark Souls. So, yeah, the game returns out a handful of employees, former employees. Um, <laughs> they discussed poor working conditions and low pay. From Software Left on Career Connection, which isn't super reliable, but gives you at least a ballpark idea, said that they had a satisfaction rating of 2.6 out of 5 stars, employing review sites, low uh, compensation from the workload, 40 months of overtime per month. 40 months of overtime? Maybe 40 hours of overtime is what they meant. 40 hours, 40 months per month. Um, no maternity leave and more. They've also started to notice reviews of poor conditions at From Software. They reveal more employed, blah, blah, blah. Um, some level of crunching. Despite, you know, they say that they, they don't have crunch. Employees are saying there is. Um, yeah, during critical periods of game releases, I often had to work early mornings and overtime for two to three months. And in terms of pay... Let's see. From Software employees also spoke about low pay at the studio. One source said their salary quote is not adequate and added their co-workers felt the same according to data on career connection the average annual income for a from software employee is 3.41 million yen which comes out to just under twenty five thousand dollars usd it is worth noting that yen is very weak compared to the dollar so that direct conversion from yen to usd may not be entirely representative of the employee compensation but they also operate in tokyo where the cost of living is higher than most other places in japan 
Elden Ring publisher Bandai Namco announced a pay raise for all its employees following the success of Elden Ring, um, which was a story that followed after it. Um, and it was increased by 50,000 yen, which at the time in 2022, again, it was particularly weak, but it's not exactly like, you know, seeing a, a massive spike. You know, if, if we go back to like 2022, when this news dropped, they were roughly in the same. It actually probably was a little bit stronger than now. So, you know, it would have been even better, but still we're talking about like a few hundred dollars a month. Um, so this is like the thing where a lot of people are like, how does from software do it? It's like, honestly, it's kind of because they don't like, they don't really pay very well. The average salary is approximately $43,000 a year. Whereas in the U S or in Montreal or some of these studios, uh, or places where studios are housed, the salaries are more like 80 to $120,000 US. Um, and the cost of living in the US is lower than in Tokyo. So like, it's, <laughs> it's easy to just be like, well, they've been able to do it. It's like, yeah, but their employees are not exactly getting, getting rich. Like you, you will make more working at Ubisoft than you will working at From Software. But you probably don't hear a lot about this, you know, because it's from software and everybody's like, no, they're great. And it's also in a different country and they speak a different language. So it's easier to kind of put up a wall and be like, well, it's just cultural differences. But it's like, it still is, I think, exploitative, exploitative. Um, Because I mean, from software makes some every time they drop a game it's one of the most successful games of the year and they do not get compensated on that level unfortunately um you know and sure like i remember tons of people praising bandai namco for giving raises and i do think they deserve credit for announcing raises because that's good i mean that's great but also like bandai namco is reporting record profits meanwhile the employees are making <laughs> like pretty anemic salaries even after the raises you know um but one of the reasons they can afford to do that is because everybody wants to work on on a from software game like everybody would love to do that you know it's the same reason why people put up with grind at Naughty Dog for years because you were working on a Naughty Dog game. That's going to look great on your resume. So you put up with the abuse because it's going to be worth it in the long run. You know, you might not be at this studio forever, but on your resume, it'll look great. You know? Yeah, well, and this is why location of studios matters, but more than anything, it matters about where the talent is. That's why so many studios are centered in places like Montreal or might be centered in San Francisco or Paris or whatever. And it's because that's where all the talent is. So if you want to recruit high quality talent that's going to make world class games, you have to be in a location where those people either are or want to live. And as a result, costs go up because it's more expensive to live there. So you have to pay your employees more and that drives the cost of those games up. And so it, it just gets more and more complicated. But when you have a really successful studio that makes world-class games, you end up with employees that are willing to put up with a lot more uh, crap because they are benefiting also indirectly. Like they're being compensated with the experience that they can use to later negotiate. Um, for other things, you know. Yeah. yeah. Also an issue with Japanese corporate culture and salaries in general. Yeah, I mean, th and that's part of the reason why I think a lot of people are able to kind of look the other way with this. Where they're like, uh, th yeah, this is bad, but it's also, you know, in Japan things are different. And this is just how it is. You know, it's a different, different thing for them. But I don't think that necessarily excuses it. Like, yeah, we can be like, oh, well, you know, Ubisoft, if they were, you know, had a really dysfunctional company and you're uh, like everything going on three, four years ago, especially um, right around the time Valhalla was launching with all the 
like abuse allegations and stuff, you'd be like, oh, well, you know, but they're a French company. Things are different. You wouldn't do that. That's ridiculous. <laughs> that doesn't excuse taking advantage of your employees, right? Shouldn't. Shouldn't. But this is part of the way that from software and Bandai Namco are able to pump out these huge games on tighter budgets, you know, and manage it. It's because they are paying their employees like half of what other companies are paying them. So yeah, their budgets are going to be smaller. Like sure will be. <laughs> and yeah, they can, they can afford to uh, pump this out more than a, a company like like uh, Ubisoft might be able to, because Ubisoft, if they're based in France and they have to pay their employees a lot, and I will say I've spoken to a lot of Ubisoft developer, uh, well, developers and employees, and a lot of them really, really like it. A lot of them are very happy working at Ubisoft. Um, I've come across one instance where I spoke to somebody who was very unhappy. That was right around the time of Valhalla, and they were dealing with some abuse stuff, um, which was pretty horrible and thankfully everybody that was involved with that that was in a position of power that was like uh, instigating and, and supporting the abuse all of those people are gone now um so cheers to that uh but beyond that everybody else i've ever spoken to that worked at ubisoft really enjoyed it so you know the like in order to pay for that, though, Ubisoft has to charge a lot or find other ways to make money. And that's by pumping out 15 live service games, hoping one of them sticks. It's by having $130 versions of Star Wars games. Like, that's just what they try to do. Xerox, hello from Twitch. Love your work. Congrats on 500,000 subs. You deserve it. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you. Um, Yeah, appreciate you, my friend. Yeah, it's just all, it's all crazy. But this, this whole thing is, is just, there's a lot of selective outrage with these things, unfortunately, where, um, uh, oh, that's weird. My chat just shut down on my, uh, my page with the YouTube stream. There we go. That was weird. That was weird. The whole page like blanked out and stopped showing me any, any info. That was odd. But anyway, yeah. So there's just a lot of selective outrage with it um, where we might rage about one company doing this, but then we don't bring it up with another company because we happen to like their games more. And then, again, that's just where I start to not take the outrage that seriously. Like if you're going to throw a fit about, about, these things and then try to point to from software as an example. Well, you see, they don't have to to do this. It's like, yeah, because they pay their employees half of what other companies <laughs> like pay. Like it and they're in a very expensive city. Yeah, dude, like look at this. After the success of Elden Ring, the starting salary will be raised from the previous 232,000 yen per month to 290,000. And the yen is all over the place in terms of value to the US dollar. So it's really tough to compare because in 2022, this was different than today. It's, the yen has actually dropped. But um, like straight up, we just had a Bucky's open in Colorado. You will make more than this working at Bucky's, which is a massive gas station, than you will working at From Software if you converted the money today. Like working at a world class video game studio in a starting position, to be fair, but world class video game development studio that makes some of the best games in the world. Or you could work at an actual gas station and make more. And it's it is verifiably more expensive to live in Tokyo than to live in like Johnstown or Berthid next to this gas station that just opened. So um, this, yeah, th this is why <laughs> I don't take it super seriously when people are like, well, you know, these companies are all raising prices and trying to find ways to make more money, but from software doesn't have to do that. Like, yeah, if, if you had basically a collection of, 
like people that you're paying high school wages to to make the best games in the world yeah yeah no you'd be able to do it too um thank you my friend to daniel for the super chat um what do you think about the star wars outlaws prices yeah we've talked about it throughout the stream <clears throat> some people have brought it up but it's just it's a reflection of the current state of the industry. Licensed IP games are stupid expensive to make. And like Star Wars Outlaws probably needs to sell seven, eight, nine million copies to break even, much less make a profit. So it has to be one of the most financially successful games of the year to break even. And part of that, you know, people can just be like, oh, well, it's corporate greed. Not really. It's just because if you pay people a decent wage and you give them time to work on a game, it takes hundreds of millions of dollars to make a triple A size game. And in order to recoup that, you either have to sell 8 million copies or you have to also sell hundred dollar versions, $130 versions, which I don't think you should buy. Like nobody should be pre-ordering anything. Like we don't even know if the base game is worth $70 yet. <laughs> so do not spend $130 on a game we haven't even seen. Okay. Nobody should be paying for that. It's insane. But hopefully you can understand why this is happening. And it, to be fair, it's been happening for like a decade. I mean, Ubisoft has had ultimate editions and gold editions of their games for like 15 years or something stupid like that. So it, this is not a new thing at all, but part of the reason it's continuing is because it's so expensive to put these games together and it takes so many copies to break even. And when people counter it with the most like brain dead thing of, well, but Elden Ring didn't manage to, uh, to have super expensive editions. I mean, for one, they had a collector's edition, but th that's, I grant you that's a special instance because you get a physical millennia statue in addition to it. But, uh, it's like, yeah, they didn't have to do all of this stuff because they pay their employees less than my local gas station attendant makes, which I've worked as a janitor. I respect the hell out of people that work very difficult jobs like that. My point is the people that are making Elden Rings DLC, the people that are making the best, some of the best action RPGs ever made are making less than high schoolers. And they're living in a more expensive city. Like that's insane. But it's really easy to just point to it, but, but they don't have it. Yeah, maybe look, dig into it a little bit, <laughs> you know? You know? Like, it's crazy. So they pay their employees shit and then have the balls to sell their DLC premium edition at $50. Yeah. Stop comparing two different countries on salaries. We're comparing, uh, and I've been very, very clear, currency conversion rates are extremely fluid things change constantly these articles are based in 2022 where the salaries were outlined at 290,000 yen per month um that some months that would be the equivalent of like 2000 usd other months it might be 1800 usd it changes all the time it's very fluid these things alter all the time nobody's denying that at all um what you also cannot deny is that that is a very low salary for somebody working at a world-class studio. And that's why employees at From Software, former and current, are actively upset, have been for years and still are today, at how they are treated, how they're compensated and paid. Like, they work on world-class games, are expected to crunch, and then also don't get paid uh, very well at all. You know, and again, this is not like some sweatshop studio pumping out mobile games. Like this is a world-class studio <laughs> and I, I don't like, it doesn't make when you defend it, you're not like you're defending Bandai Namco. Like you're defending executives and managers of a multi-billion dollar company. Like you're not fighting for the little guy, <laughs> you know, like it's crazy. It's crazy. So like, I don't, I don't find it particularly noble. Didn't they break away from Bandai? No, they acquired. So they, they have a couple of like 
rights disputes that have gone on, but basically they acquired the rights to their IP from Bandai. But Bandai, and they've discussed how they want to self-publish things and they don't want to be um, tied so directly to Bandai Namco, which just makes sense. I mean, at this point, they sell so many copies of games. They're giving up a chunk of that to a publisher they don't technically need. Like, yeah, self-publish just makes more sense. Um, so, yeah. You twisted your words. I read your words. If you type them wrong, I'm sorry, but I, I read your message like word for word. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know what you want from me. Yeah. No, to be fair, like, yeah. So uh, I, I realized I said, yeah, while your name is typed out YA. Yeah. Uh, so low salary, but you have universal public health care in Japan, like in Israel and 10% income tax. So they still have better life than in the US. I mean, I don't know who, whose life is better. Uh, <laughs> like, I'm American. Naturally, I like America. So I, I also respect the hell out of Japan in many, many ways. I don't think it's a competition. Either way, I think if you're making a world-class game and you are in a world-class studio and you are leading to world record-breaking profits from your games, it's it's shameful that they are getting paid uh, among the lowest software developers among Japanese developers. Like, it, it's crazy to me. You would think, oh, most successful studio? they'll be like having the they'll have the most impressive salaries right you you would just assume that they'd make more if they're making better stuff but that's not a given at all yeah we actually got into finance friday yeah kind of yeah Abhinav, Japan has one of the worst office culture. I've lived in Japan for two years. Yeah, it's it's very... It's very different than I think... Like, you see those, those uh, TikToks or videos of, like, the employees at tech companies in the U.S. where they, like, don't really work at all. They just go to, like, the meta, like, the Facebook meta lounge, and they have a Starbucks built in with unlimited food, and... They are expected to work about 90 minutes and then, you know, they go to their Zumba class all together and it's just hilarious. Like, I wonder if I can find that. Um, it'll blow your mind. You're like, this is what they get paid $800,000 to do. Let's see if I can find it. There was one that went like viral because it was so... Laughable. Uh, did she delete it? I think she did delete it. <laughs> I don't blame her. She got roasted for it. Um, is this one? Welcome to a day in my life as a corporate baddie in nyc per usual i started my day off at the gym look at my little abs trying to peek through tee then i worked from home for a little bit before getting ready to go into the office i was feeling bougie today so i decided to go to the hudson yards office and when i tell y'all literally everything about this place is grand as hell like the big doors to the marble floors everything is bougie and i'd be eating it up and look at this view from the office like immaculate anyway i ate lunch when i got to work and linked with mishka of course to do work for the rest of the day and some people on ig seemed bothered that they didn't see me working so much in the last one so here's a boring clip of me typing anyway after a long day of working we went to the office mini bar and took shots before heading <laughs> the to the office San mini bar. feast the festival was cute and had lots to eat. I heard you're supposed to get one of these Italian sausage rolls, but honestly, it was not even busting like people said it was. I got a cannoli, which was actually really good, and took my drunk ass home. Welcome to a day. I just love that she could say with a straight face, I went to the office mini bar. <laughs> like, oh my God, it's amazing. It's amazing. But like, this is like, Corporate America in the U.S., and I'll say this as somebody, again, with a a uh, 
a corporate finance degree that has circled the the finance world. Um, here it's Miss Nicole Sai. Is this it? Uh, no. Oh no, one of these girls got fired after she posted one of these videos. Oh no. Um, yeah, a fired Google employee's emotional wrecked day in the life video on TikTok went viral as it captured heartbreak after she found out she was one of the 12,000 laid off. She's a TikTok vlogger, uh, got a text. Uh, check who got to work and you don't have access. I know this isn't, this isn't the same lady. I don't think. No, this isn't the same lady. There was one lady who posted it and she's like, she was an employee at Meta. And it was just like, she just described how they went and like ate all day and then like had a call with some people and then all went out to eat. And she shows the bills of the places they're going out to and they're spending like $800 on dinner. Like it's crazy. It was crazy. And they just casually mention it. Like, you know, it, it's just so out of touch. They had to be trolling. Is it really like this? So I did a deal, um, a multifamily deal with a Google engineer, really sweet guy. Very, very nice guy. Uh, he just had more dollars than cents. Like he, he made such stupid amounts of money. He made like 800 something thousand dollars a year. And he, own dozens and dozens of single family homes. Like he just would, I think he lived with his mom in the mountains and he just spent all his money buying single family homes and investment properties and stuff. But he was a really nice guy, but made outrageous amounts of money. And I talked to him one time when we were like at a, uh, I think we were actually at closing and I asked him how it was working for Google. And he was like, honestly, dude, it is very nice. Sometimes it doesn't even really feel like we're working. There's a ton of bloat. And uh, he told me, he's like, honestly, I think we could probably be at half the size of our team and, and be just fine. He's like, there's just so much stuff going on. What's interesting is that, um, and I, I talked to my dad about this. I mentioned this on stream before, but it, it's like well-known in the corporate world, especially in the tech space, that a lot of these companies will hire people just to keep them away from other companies. So Meta, for example, they were hiring up a ton of AI engineers just to keep them from working at Apple. That's all they wanted to do. So they would hire like guys that specialized in virtual reality stuff and they would put them on salaries to do basically nothing but sit in the office all day just so Apple wouldn't hire them and get their, excuse me, get their talent and know-how. And this is like a well-known thing that they will hire talent to keep them away from the competition. And uh, they'll do that with like stock packages and things like it's, it's crazy. Yeah. It's why Elon was able to get rid of like 80% or something insane of the staff at Twitter and the company still operated just like normal. I mean, I, I know there were some technical hiccups at first, but the website is operating perfectly normally. It's just doing its own thing. Yes. They lost advertisers, but that's mostly because of Elon's uh, statements publicly. It's not because of the operations of the site, um, except you could say maybe moderation and stuff, but like he fired 80% of the staff and everything's working seemingly fine, but it's because these tech companies have exploded and bloated so much that they're extremely inefficient. And that's the thing with Google as well, where Google, you know, a bunch of investors have grown very frustrated with Google because they used to be cutting edge developers and engineers and stuff. And now with that, like Google Bard debacle, where they tried to launch this AI tool to compete with open AI's chat GPT models. And people start asking it to generate images of like, let's just say uh, the national socialist German workers party in the 1940s. And it's so focused on trying to boost diversity and representation in the things it does that it starts posting pictures of black and like Hispanic Nazis because they're so focused on diversity that they can't even show like 
a white German guy, even in the context of like trying to generate an image of, of uh, a member of that political organization. And it was a total humiliation. Investors were livid. They were livid, but it was because like the, the company is just so bloated and fractured and doesn't really know what their priorities are anymore. So it's just dysfunctional. And uh, they've actually had calls for their CEO to be fired and all sorts of stuff. It was crazy. So I, I think that, you know, corporate America in the U.S. is very, very weird where there's a lot of cushiony jobs that are very, very nice. And after Elon did all that stuff with Twitter, a lot of executives realized maybe we could be running a leaner ship. And I think that's also part of the reason, in addition to many other things, why there's been so many layoffs in corporate America this year. And it's just because there's so much bloat in so many ways. You know, it's crazy. Um, yeah. In the U.S., yeah, in Scandinavia, in Scandinavia, maybe it's more efficient. That would be my hope, at least. In the U.S., it's it's well known that if you get a job at like a Google or a Meta, you are in a very cushy job and you won't have to do a whole lot. Like one of the guys I went to, um, I was in what which one? I think it was our international finance course. It was Finn 475, whatever that was. So we were we were in a class together like last semester of college, senior year. And uh, he went off. He worked with J.P. Morgan Chase for a little bit right after school because um, he was working in New York City. And then he went off and he started working within like the finance department at. It was one of the big tech companies. I can't. Uh. Oh, it's going to drive me crazy. I don't think it was Oracle. It was one of those like that. But anyway, he went and started working at one of these big tech companies in New York City. And he was like, it's kind of driving me crazy because we just don't really do much all day. We just kind of like hang out. He's like, it's kind of nice because we're making really good money. But it's weird feeling like you shouldn't have a job. <laughs> He's like, I don't really do anything. It's just weird. In game studios, I don't think it's quite the same. Um... I mean, there's been stories and reporting about like act or uh, yeah, no Activision where there's entire teams within like the Call of Duty teams where they just don't really do much. Um, so like there was that one story that dropped. It was before Microsoft officially acquired them. So maybe it was like a year and a half, two years ago. But there was the story of how there were groups of like dozens of dudes and like clicks of guys that were working on Call of Duty that just wouldn't do anything like all day, but they just pass all the work off to their underlings and make them do all the heavy lifting and they would just kind of hang out all day or they would just play Call of Duty testing things and not do anything. And this was like well known and reported on widely that there was just this boys club of different clicks that would just not do stuff in these big organizations. And you start to be like, oh, so maybe that's how you have a, a studio of like 2000 people, but each year you only manage to put out like a few little cosmetic bundles and and you end up breaking the balance of tons of different weapons and stuff so casually. Yeah, it obviously depends on the game studio and it depends on the tech company. Some tech companies obviously are very efficient and are capable of doing amazing things. Like you look at freaking OpenAI, they've not been sleeping at the at the computer desk. You know, they've been doing some good work for a while, uh, which is why they're taking the world by storm. But I think that they they were primarily capitalizing on the complacency of a lot of other big tech companies in corporate America. So they didn't have to do anything. The game has been pretty much the same for 15 years. Yeah, kind of. Oh, Jimothy, I'm glad you asked that question. I'll mention this uh, again real quick, just in case you want to check it out. That's a good uh, good segue. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see if it actually works. Come on, chatbot. There we go. 
So these, you can see the link just right there. My chat is slowly catching up. It's getting there. Oop. There we go. So these are just sty mags, which are just fun little uh, magnetic toys. They're actually a Kickstarter. So you can check them out at that link that just popped up in chat. And um, yeah, they're just like a fun fidget toy if you like magnets and stuff and just like keeping your hands busy. I have been playing with these things for like weeks. I cannot stop myself. It's a problem. And uh, sty mags very generously offered to sponsor the streams. So I was like, hell yeah. I mean, I've been playing with them a lot, so <laughs> why not? So uh, shout out to Stymax, check them out. They're just a, a fun little fidgety toy if you're interested. And I mean, as you can see, they initially posted their fundraiser or that rather their Kickstarter targeting $12,000. They've done 292,000, <laughs> so they're doing just fine. And you can see their stretch goals. They have all sorts of like additional colors that'll be available depending on which stretch goal they get to and so you know now they're working on terracotta teal and if they get five hundred fifty thousand dollar raise they'll do glow in the dark ones so pretty good pretty good they're fun i've had a lot of fun with them so check them out links there and uh yeah shout out to stem eggs for um for doing that yeah definitely watch out if you got like dogs or, or kids around you should never let kids play with anything they could swallow um even if they're fun because ori likes to try to take these because he just finds them fun as well he finds magnets interesting which i do too <laughs> you know magnets how do they work but you can't let them do it you can't let kids play with the magnets it's bad for them uh okay okay um what else do we have we touched on that we touched on that we touched on that i don't know Luke, you should do voiceovers for books on Audible. You have a soothing voice that hypnotizes me, like the pheromones that casinos use to get you to stay longer. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's just my voice. If anybody has any jobs you want me to do, any voiceovers, hit me up. <laughs> hit me up I'll, I'll i'll help that yeah you sound boring yeah i sound i have a voice that swallows time and makes you forget what you were doing <laughs> i'll take it <laughs> you just uh you help me to zone out and fall asleep um okay yeah you're right you're right finance friday okay should we listen should we look at a couple of cringy finance tips real quick to wrap up is that what we should do Okay, there's this one. I haven't seen this one. I don't know what he says, so buckle up. It could be brilliant. It could be really stupid. Let's see. Let's see. People that say it's a quarter till this, a quarter till this time, that shit has always angered me. Why? That's some of those... That, okay, what's a quarter? I, I didn't learn this till this year. A quarter doesn't mean 25 minutes. It's a quarter past nine, 925. Completely wrong. That's not... Oh, my God. Okay, well... Completely wrong. What is... So it's 15? Correct. What? Tell me what the? How does that make sense? Explain that to me. Because of dude is getting like all riled up. He's very confident. He's got a good point here. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh, this hurts. But where does Todd Howard fit into this? That's a great question, Sammy. That's a great question. If I ever meet Todd, it's gonna be the ultimate crossover. I swear. Um, yeah. This is this hurts already. Well, like this is one of those things where somebody gets really riled up and is like. I don't know. You could tell he was in the shower this morning and thought of this and was like, yeah, that's a really good point. 25 cents is a quarter, but for an hour, it's only 15 minutes. That's stupid. Like he's just never heard of fractions. A quarter, a qu you're, you're thinking straight to currency. A yes. Qu a quarter is a fourth. That's all a quarter is. Well, okay. A quarter is a fourth of anything. It's a fourth of anything. Don't think of the actual. I don't understand itself. that. A fourth. Oh my God. It's almost for a moment. It looked as if he was thinking, but then he shut it down. <laughs> He's like, nope, can't. Yeah, I don't understand, understand that. A fourth, a quarter of 10 is 2.5. 2.5, 25. Where is this 15 coming? Example. Yeah, where's 15 Plus coming 60. from? An hour is 60 minutes. So okay. if you break it into fourths, a quarter 25, is 15. 50. When did we start speaking in currency? Like, what no, I say? It's, it's a dollar 30 until.
18? What am I supposed to like? What is <laughs> this guy? I don't know for a fact. This guy probably graduated from high school. Like this is one of those people like these people are out there. Okay. Just remember that. Remember that these people are real. <laughs> It's a dollar thirty till noon. Who the who are we? It's a dollar thirty till eighteen. If you fused currency and military time, people are gonna think you just walked out of a spaceship. That one hurts. That one hurts. Average Twitter user right there, and TikTok user, I guess. Uh, that's that's pretty bad. That's pretty bad. Oh, this was funny. This was funny. So this guy. This guy posted this, okay? And he was very proud of it. He said, watch me make $6,000 trading SPY today in the last 12 minutes of the market. I waited patiently for a setup all day. So this is one of those guys that's like selling a, a training course and you pay $600 and he'll teach you how to get rich or whatever. Which, to be clear, if you ever have something like that, like you just don't buy it. <laughs> just don't. If he had a way to make all that money, he would not be sharing it for $600. Um, he'd be going to a, a hedge fund and selling that information for billions, but you know, whatever. Sure. He's probably on Twitter doing it, but somebody noticed in the video he posted, they zoomed in close and they spotted something specifically the account number and the description of it. This is what's called a top step evaluation account which is basically a practice account that you can use to tweak settings and just hypothetically see how a, a strategy could have worked um, if you were to have done it back then. It's kind of like a back test, you know, it's, it's just a back test. And this guy tried to frame it as though he made $6,000, so you should believe me and all my finance advice when it's all just totally faked. But this is the problem is like people will post this stuff on, on TikTok and people don't, realize any better and so they'll just buy into it and they'll buy his course because they want to be rich and they're a high school and they just believe it and they they get themselves screwed very quickly mr Book. <laughs> a quarter is 25 right yeah a quarter is 25 past an hour 18 cents past a buck 30. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Thank you for the super chat, my friend. That's very generous. Oh, it hurts. Oh, no. Okay. This is Grant Cordone. Have any of you guys ever heard of the 10X book? So he's basically like, a, he's, uh, not quite like a Jordan Belfort type, but he's a salesman and he's a guy that is like a motivational speaker at the same time. But he had like a book and he has a training program and all this that's based around 10 xing your money, your lifestyle, all that stuff. He... Most people who know what they're talking about tend to agree that he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's had things where he's he's described his like tax strategies where he's like, yeah, I walked in there on December 31st. I bought a Rolls Royce and then I drove it the next day. I returned it, but I got to write it off for my taxes. It's like for one. You returned it. So technically the transaction is null and void. But even if you did spend the money and you didn't get the refund until the next taxable year, it would still show as an expense in the previous year and then an income in the following year. So you'd still be like in terms of taxes, it would even out. Nothing would happen. It wouldn't go anywhere. But he thinks he's like really smart and profound when he describes these things, uh, which like this is a very basic bare bones level of, of how taxes work in the U S so he is very, very wealthy, but it seems like it's because he's a good salesman and he's good at convincing people. He knows what he's talking about. Um, and it's only recently he's been debunked so much that he's kind of turned into a laughing stock, but this is described as a very hard watch. So let's see. Hey, I'm coming to San Antonio, man. Will you, will you give me five minutes? Uh, this is before anybody knew who I was, right? No books, no no kind of right. notoriety. Oh, so, Jordan Belfort. I didn't even realize that's who it was. So that's the Wolf of Wall Street. If you don't know this guy, the Leonardo DiCaprio movie is based on this guy. Sell me a pen. That's him. This is him. Notoriety. So they're like, no, no, don't come by. But see, that was interest. To me, that's interest. No, no, I'm not interested. Not interested. So is, not interested to use interest. Well, it is. It says not interested. Oh, my God. Okay. 
Okay. Not is a, a, an adjective to describe interest. Okay. Right? So it's a level of interest. So if someone says they're not I interested... Have, on then a scale from zero to ten, what interest level do you have? None. That is a level. Right. I will give Jordan Belfort credit. I don't know if it's this podcast. I did see one like a year or two ago where Jordan Belfort had Grant Cordone on. And he was like, you're not like a salesman, though. You just love money. It's like, and that's okay. I love money, too. But he's like, you're not a salesman. You don't love the, the game of sales. You just love the game of money. And I think like he's right. He'll call people out. Like he's a, he is a good salesman, but he is very schmarmy. He's very schmoozy. Um, he's very very pushy. But that's how he made his millions. I mean, he was very successful because he was good at that stuff. But Grant Cordon is not like that. Grant Cordon just, as you can hear, he's like, yeah, but not interest is a level of interest. Like that's supposed to be profound. But it like it doesn't mean anything. You're just saying. Yeah, she's n it, yeah she's not interested. No, that means she's interested, bro. Yeah, he's, like stalker logic right here. Okay, and then one, two, three, four, five. You with me? A few minutes ago, he didn't know he he didn't know he had no interest. At least I'm on. You see what I'm saying? You get it? Well, I wouldn't do that. I I disagree with that. But yeah, I, I'm not saying I that. Not, this, I re reasonable minds could differ. I, hey, I'm yeah. So, but this is why I like Jordan at the very least because he can hear that and just go. No, I I don't agree with that. I think that that's bad. If somebody says they're not interested, I wouldn't pursue it. So, no. <laughs> uh. Oh yeah. Uh, just some casual fraud. Bankruptcy is low key lit. I used credit cards to go on a luxury or on luxury vacations, plural, after I got disbarred from being a lawyer. $35,000 in debt, and all I had to do was file some paperwork to make it go away. Dave Ramsey would be proud. I'm debt free now. I mean, he's probably also half joking, but uh, if you knowingly are taking out debt, like uh, there's. There's a, a thing that'll happen in bankruptcy hearings where the judge will ask you, at what point did you realize you were insolvent? At what point did you realize you were broke? And how much money, what did you buy? Like, how much money did you spend? What did you buy after that point? And if they can demonstrate and prove that you knew you were insolvent and broke and then continue to spend money after that, none of that debt can be voided out. That will carry with you. They won't grant those bankruptcy in those cases. Um, so it's that's just not how that works. Some people got really lucky during COVID because COVID, they just started granting pretty much any um, any bankruptcy that would come along. Like famously, or maybe not so famously, DSP had to bring him up. He got his bankruptcy granted in the middle of COVID is my understanding. And... Based on what I've heard with that whole situation, that bankruptcy should not have been granted uh, because he was claiming $5,000 a month in business expenses as a stay-at-home streamer who doesn't play anything with microtransactions on stream. So what seems was happening is that he was writing off microtransactions from mobile games he was playing as business expenses, which he didn't use in the operation of the business, which is also known as uh tax fraud so <laughs> I, if he ever tries to do it again he is going to be in uh some serious trouble um for sure this guy has a course he seems like he knows what he's doing let's see what he says I spent the last $7,500 I had in my bank account to hire one of my first mentors. And that literally left me with no cash, so I got a tattoo of a boat burning on fire right after I made that investment. This was to signify that I was burning the ships and there was no way back. After I bought the course, I spent the next 14 days doing 12 to 14 hours per day of studying the course and taking action so that I could grow my business. Two weeks after I spent every dollar I had in my bank to hire the mentor, I made my first $5,000 dollars sale then i went out and i got a phoenix tattoo emerging from the ashes of the flame to signify the fact that once i burned the ships i was able to emerge as a new beast take this video as a sign that it's time to start going all in yeah in other words please buy my course <laughs> this is the same like logic that um those like old school prosperity gospel preachers would say and, and do 
like uh, what was his name um crap what was his name uh robert tilton robert tilton this guy so this guy was a big big head honcho prosperity gospel preacher in i believe the 80s made like hundreds of millions of dollars okay freakishly successful and he had the same logic where it's like you need to go all in with god and make a vow so he said you know if you have a savings account spend all your money and in this like context of the guy from uh tiktok and in investors he's like yeah you got to go all in put all your money into my course and into my my training and then that will somehow generate profits for you you'll somehow find success from there but this guy would do the same thing where he's like yeah put it all in you know and then you, god will give you money on the back end. it's the same scammer logic that they do to try and take advantage of of people pregnant with miracles inside of me i've learned not to operate in my name but jesus's name I've learned not to operate in my strength, but his strength. I've learned not to operate in my health, but his health. And I've learned not to operate in my riches, but his riches. Glory, I know how to fish. See, I'm not on this program <laughs> telling you. Oh, this one. That's a word. As surely as I'm speaking by the Spirit of God, that is a word for a person right now. That is God penetrating your heart. It's burning on the inside of you, and you need to make a vow of faith of a thousand dollars. Oh, Bob, couldn't you say twenty-five? No, you can't make a thousand-dollar vow of faith. I'm saying in faith. <laughs> and this guy's framing it as yes, and you need to make a vow of faith, investing into your financial future burn your bridges he's straight up arguing that like yeah i found success because i spent my last few dollars i spent all the money i had hiring a mentor and maybe for him it did work maybe you know he did find success that way um but 99 percent of people are not going to find success that way and that's a very bad idea to do that um oh no oh this one looks scary okay what's this one extra money I've started selling trade lines on my credit cards. I'm using this site. This isn't sponsored. I just want to point out that they're like legit. And so essentially what this is, if a person has bad credit, but they know that they need to get a mortgage or a car loan or something, they pay money to this website. This website matches them up with me based on what they're looking for. And I add them as an authorized user to my credit card for a set amount of time. They don't physically get any sort of card. They don't get my name. They don't have my information. I have all of their information, um, but the thing is, because they're an authorized user, they get my credit history, and that raises their credit score. They get a better interest rate on whatever loan they're trying to get. And I would not be doing this if I didn't know multiple people in person who had also done this and like said it was legit, because it seems so sketchy. I gave this website my banking information so that they can direct deposit me money. And the amount you get paid depends on your credit limit, the length of card has been open, various things. And so the ones I have ranges from $40 to $80, which might not sound like much, but if I get $40 and it took me five minutes to add an authorized user on my credit card, that's worth it for me. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So what she's describing is adding some random person that pays this website money, uh, as an authorized user. And then that person, because they're now an authorized user on the credit account, they will then have that account listed on their credit report and they could in theory benefit from that. So like, say you have a hundred like 10,000, let's just say $10,000 in credit card debt. And you have one credit card with that maxed out. That's what you've got. So on your credit report, if it was run today, you'd have hundred percent credit utilization. Your account isn't very old. It's like a year old. You maxed it out. You haven't made payments. All the payments are late, all that stuff. If you went through this service, you could get added as an authorized user on a bunch of other accounts. So instead of it showing $10,000, hundred percent credit utilization, you could have like 200,000 or a million dollars worth of credit available to you. 
and only $10,000 maxed out, which looks way better and doesn't look like you're as irra or irresponsible. So you'd be more likely to get approved for the loan. The reason this doesn't make any sense is because like this is super illegal. Um, this is fraud, probably classified as wire fraud. Wire fraud is one of those weird charges that can fit into many random little spots and gray areas. But uh, nobody's going to argue that this is legit or that this would be uh, or should be allowed because it's you're lying. Not only is this person facilitating fraud and is helping this person lie knowingly and they're being compensated for it, but also the person that paid the website to do this is trying to deceive the lender into thinking that they are more capable of handling a higher amount of debt or better rates or whatever. And so they also are knowingly committing fraud. Um, it just, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, straight to jail. Straight to jail. Uh, you undercook chicken. Straight to jail. Yeah, that's basically what this is. This is unbelievable. I mean, the fact that anybody would do this is horrifying. And she says that she's doing it for 40 to $80. Like, 40 to $80 to commit wire fraud is unbelievable. That's crazy. Wow. Um, that one just hurts. That one just really hurts. Okay. And then let's, let's watch one last one to see, to see, uh, this guy show us the, the way the account is CEO cells underscore already with this haircut. I'm not convinced this is real, but let's see. Rent a home or buy a home? Which one should you do? Buying a home, you're paying off your own equity every month. Renting a home, you're paying off someone's mortgage. And then you could take out that initial equity, buy another home, and now you have two homes. Or I guess you could just rent for the rest of your life. Rent a home or... Okay. Oh my god. Okay. Um... <laughs> There's so many little things wrong with this that just show you that he doesn't have any idea what he's talking about. Uh, he's just echoing things that he's heard from other people. Buying a home, you're paying off your own equity every month. You're not paying off equity. You don't pay off equity. You would technically pay off a liability to gain equity. So if you're paying off your equity, you're doing something very wrong. So for one, that doesn't make any sense at all. Renting a home, you're paying off someone's mortgage. Maybe that's possible. So I'd say that's probably fair. If you're renting a house that somebody owns through a traditional mortgage, then yeah, your your rent payment's going towards paying somebody else's mortgage. And then you could take all that equity or n initial equity. I don't see how these follow, but he's like, okay, so you're paying off your own mortgage. Gaining equity is probably what he means. And then you could take that equity that you got by paying it off and buy another home. And now you have two homes, which he does by holding up four fingers. <laughs> um, you know, two homes, <laughs> but I, <laughs> I'm not, I don't think he's being real. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think this is real, but I mean, you can technically refinance. So the great thing about refinancing debt is that you can take it out tax-free. So if I refinance my home today and I take out 50 grand or hundred grand, whatever, I don't have to pay income taxes on that because it's being taken out under interest for a loan. Um, it would be the same thing. Like if you took out a, you know, it wouldn't make sense for you to take out a mortgage on a house and then have to pay interest on that. That wouldn't make any sense. Um, oh, thank you. Um, so like that just doesn't really make a lot of sense but with all that like you could technically use it to get another house if you're allowed but everybody just assumes that'll work but it's not a given like the bank will still require you to fit under certain loan to value ratios it'll still allow or require you to have certain income levels so it's not like you can just not work a job and then just keep refinancing out of homes and buying new ones. It doesn't work like that. Like a bank is not going to give you a loan if they don't think you can reasonably pay for the next one. 
Because why would they? It wouldn't make any sense. Um, and, you know, this is the most bare bones. Like, I watched a TikTok video on how to build a financial portfolio type of thing I've ever seen. Like, it's just so bare bones. It doesn't have any substance. And the fact that he's getting something as, like, wrong as simple as paying off equity makes me think that he really just has no idea what he's doing or saying. He's just echoing what um, he's heard other people say. Um, oh, no. Okay, I know I said that was the last one. Right. Whenever I see a crypto bro, I I can't resist. So y'all seen my video yesterday, right? This was at a hundred dollars. It has gone up sixty-seven dollars in twenty-four hours. Actually, oh hold on. Today's return sixty-four dollars. Total return a hundred and eleven. That's in four days. I I invested in this four days ago, and it's yes. Do not believe anybody. Everybody doubted Dogecoin and thought it wasn't going to amount to anything. And now look at it. Almost 20 cent. Whoa. This, this, 3.8 million. Get it. Get it now before it goes up more. It is constantly, steadily going up. Do not listen to these people saying it ain't going nowhere. It's going. It's happening now. $60 overnight. Thought y'all said it won't go do nothing. So y'all seen my video yesterday. It's just, it honestly is heartbreaking. He should quit his day job. It's honestly heartbreaking because like these these kids are told or convinced themselves that, OK, you had a 61 percent return on a hundred dollar balance. OK. But the reason these are considered extremely volatile assets is because they're extremely volatile. So they go up and they go down a lot. And in terms of crypto itself, it's a speculative asset. So it's not even something that is backed up by any sort of financial instrument. It's just a thing that people agree is worth a certain amount. And that's the only reason it's worth anything. Um, oh my God. Me in 2025, after I make $10 million from Shiba because I invested $1,000 every week into it in 2024. Up 98% right now. For the first time in four years, you have a chance to get filthy rich. Laugh now or laugh to the bank. Hashtag crypto. And th this is just the unfortunate thing. Some of these guys, like, they did get lucky. And technically, this is the thing. Like, when you're gambling, you can get lucky. There are ways or there are occasions where people make a bet and get lucky. It's rare. But you, it can happen. But... When you're looking at somebody who is making bets and gambling and there's a winner, it's really easy to ignore all the losers, all the people that lost uh, yeah, collectively millions and millions of dollars in the crypto crashes of the last few years. Like, it's just tragic, you know? What's a good solid bond, to, in your opinion? Eh, I mean, it depends on broader market conditions if it makes sense to invest in bonds. Um, there is still broader indexes and ETFs and stuff that trade bonds for you. So they handle all the crap for that. So I'd look into like a Fidelity. Like Fidelity, uh, they have some bond indexes that they use. So I'd do something like that. Like As for buying individual bonds... I don't know if it's worth the the trouble. I bought some bonds um, like a few years ago that were at like eight or nine percent for for a year, but they always have limitations where it's like you can buy one or two. Um, so it's just all over the place. It, it's just tough. Bonds are are tricky because they only really make sense on a large scale that most people are not going to be dealing with. So it makes more sense to just look for. Uh, a fund that's bothered with buying and buying them in bulk, you know. Um, I bought Nvidia stock ten years ago, and I'm a billionaire now. Holla, you know, Dylan. I think the only way for us to believe you is if you were to like send through 
like a million dollar super chat or something. I think then we'd all believe you. But I mean, until then, I just, I don't know if the chat will believe you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um, hey, Luke, <laughs> I don't know anything about investing in stocks, but would you recommend me investing in take two before uh, GTA six is release? Or should I rather put it into the Becky ETD? Uh, I mean, the thing with all of this, like, I saw somebody that was saying on one of our previous videos, they were like, oh, you should totally, um, let me pull it up. Like, you should totally buy... I think it was CDPR before Cyberpunk 2077 and other people were saying, oh, you should buy Ubisoft before AC Red comes out and you should do this and do that. But like the thing with all of this is that these releases are already priced in. Like if you think <laughs> that you've like thought of something these investors haven't, you're just wrong. You know, all of these companies are priced with this stuff already like budgeted in. So Take-Two Interactive right now is priced according to the current expected value of GTA 6 when that drops. So like even if GTA 6 releases and generates $7 billion in added revenue next year, that will still be considered a financial failure and the stock price will drop because Take-Two investors are expecting $9 billion. And this is why you can have, like, I, I I think it was after Phantom Liberty, there were some YouTubers that were posting things like, well, there's no way to twist it. Uh, Phantom Liberty has been a financial disaster for Cyberpunk's developers over at CDPR because their stock price has dropped a lot. And it's like, bro, no. <laughs> it, it can perform very well, but there are other things at play when it comes to stock prices and, and what these are valued at, you know, it's just, it's more complicated than that. <laughs> Dylan, thank you for the $2 super chat. Now I have $999,999,998. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Well, Dylan's proved it. So now everybody's got to go buy the course. Yep. Everybody hop over to his discord channel and <laughs> we have a financial expert in our midst. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah wow dylan you're right dylan made himself no longer a billionaire just for luke yeah wow wow yeah narrative driven stock perceiver yeah it, the, the whole thing is just the stock market's very complicated there's a lot of things going on at any given time um it's not as simple as just looking at one stat and being like oh wow everything's failing like this right here i mean in the last whatever this is five days Take-Two Interactive has dropped 4.2%, 420, dab, dab. Is that because Take-Two Interactive is all of a sudden failing? Does this mean that GTA 6 is going to flop because investors don't believe it anymore? No. It's also because the broader markets have been struggling. The Dow tumbled 475 points. S&P 500 suffers worst day since January as inflation fears continue, like because inflation fears are pretty bad. The whatever consumer price index rose 3.5 points or whatever uh, the other day. And so it freaked people out and investors are super scared that everybody's going to stop spending money because inflation keeps growing. But like, this is just, you can't look at one stock's performance and therefore go, okay, well that means that whatever was roughly going around, going on around this time is the pure cause for it. It's just not that simple. It just doesn't work like that. Oh yeah, the one year chart for for take two. Yeah, no, they've been doing better. Five year chart up sixty two percent. You'd hope. I mean that they've been they've been growing. You go back to like twenty ten, roughly ten dollars a share. Now they're at one forty seven. So they've been doing good. Apple over five years. I mean you can compare take two to Apple. Apple's just rocking and rolling up 246% over the same period. Netflix has been all over the place though. I mean, Netflix for a while had lost money. <laughs> you know, they were for a bit there, they were down 50% on 
on their starting point. Like, oh, oh, it's almost like when you invest in really solid, strong businesses, you'll get more returns than when you invest in struggling businesses. It's weird. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Oh, and then if we add the S&P 500, I can probably add. Do, 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 do. Uh, S&P 500, there it is. Yeah, the S&P 500, just the steady orange line. But you can see, it's it's much less volatile. It has a couple of dips, like right when COVID broke out, just like everything else. But in general, it just does its thing. Just does its thing. Just chugging along. Oh, Disney, do you want to just get depressed? Disney has been recovering a little bit uh, since Bob Iger stepped in. But yeah, I mean, look at Disney. If you go back five years, they're down 13, almost 14% from five years ago. If you go back just a year, they've been recovering a little bit. But all time, I mean, you can see Disney... You know, back in the 80s, if you were to invest, you know, it doesn't really apply to take two because they didn't start trading until 97. But um, compared to like the S&P 500, if you, were to, if you were to invest in the Walt Disney Company, you would have significantly more than if you just threw it in the S&P 500, you know, going all the way back to 84. But also back in 21, they were doing very, very well. And then they had a rough period of... <laughs> Thanks, Bob Chapek. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Disney Plus has lost them a ton of money. Yeah, it, it just in general, they've had trouble getting any movies to be successful. And their Disney Plus thing has really struggled as well. It's just they've they've had trouble um, more broadly. Okay. But they're onto this new trend called gaming. <laughs> yeah. No, I I really think Bob Iger shutting down their whole like um yeah i think i think bob Iger shutting down whatever uh, lucasfilm games and disney games and all of those projects i think that was a huge blunder because he shut down so many games with so much potential and so many amazing studios back in like 2010 and just now is starting to be like oh well maybe we should get back on that and he's trying to license them. But now all of these big publishers are shutting that down. So they're not going to be able to do deals with like Ubisoft, EA. None of them want to do any Disney IP because Disney wants to take 30% of every sale. So they're like, yeah, we're just not, not going to do that. Sure ain't. Yeah. Yeah. There's a whole thing. Um, this is also crazy. I didn't realize this, but just shout out to Larian. They've made history officially. They have, let's see, Baldur's Gate 3 passes Elden Ring and Breath of the Wild to become the first game ever to win all five major Game of the Year awards. That's crazy. So they won the Golden Joystick Game of the Year, BAFTA, Game Developer's Choice, the Dice, and the Game Awards Game of the Year. Because normally you might get like, oh, The Last of Us Part Two won a couple, and then um, Ghost of Tsushima wins another, and, you know, so it's kind of spread out a little bit. But they've actually managed to win them all, which is crazy. That's crazy. So it's just wild like but i mean it's probably the best game that could have been received this well because this game winning all these awards and being received this well and uh making as much money as it has i think 
signals to executives that gamers are capable of playing more hardcore games. Gamers want that and will feed off of it. Um, and you can have a game in a niche like a tabletop RPG inspired game and still find tremendous success. Whereas before it would have been thought that no, it's too niche. Even I, I mean, I remember people asking about Baldur's Gate three last, like early last year. And I was like, no, I mean, it's pretty niche. The, the types of people that are going to like Baldur's Gate three, pretty small. I don't think it's going to blow up to be like all that. But then I played the damn thing uh, for the review and I was like, oh God, no, it actually is that good. If people give it a chance, they will love it. They just have to give it a chance. So yeah. It was broken for like seven months after launch. I, I mean, there were a couple of bugs. I've actually, I've got on one of my save files, one bug that's pretty bad. Um, where basically, I guess to avoid spoilers, I'll just be vague. There's a, a vampire that you go after as part of like your party's, depending on who you have in your party, but as part of a storyline for a party member you might have. And if you, after you do like the big boss fight at the end of the quest line towards the end of the game, you can, uh, you're, you're prompted to like kill him or, um, settle his fate basically. But my game on that save will just not resolve the quest line. So even after you kill the big bad evil guy, it doesn't resolve. It doesn't think that the storyline's over. So it still thinks you have to choose his fate. So you can't get the resolution that you need to help you within the final quest line for the main story. And it's just broken. And I've, I've looked it up and everybody's like, yep, nope, that's just a thing it has. That's just a broken part of it. So too bad, you know, sucks to suck, but it just is how it is, unfortunately. Oh, are you talking about Jedi Survivor? Oh, yeah, Jedi Survivor is also pretty broken. I don't know if they ever fixed it even. Somebody was telling me recently that they didn't fix it. So who knows? Who knows? But anyway, fam, I think we'll call it there. Uh, no podcast this week. Joel Raptor is on vacation in China, so he's off doing his thing. Um, so we're just going to take a nice weekend break and relax. And we'll be back Monday rocking and rolling, having a great time. So thank you all for joining me on this lovely day. Thank you to everybody who super chatted, became members and subscribers and everything. Um, you guys are wonderful. I love you guys. You're fantastic. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. I love you all. Go watch the fallout show. Um, you guys are saying they did fix it. Oh, well, awesome. Awesome. I'll go punch my friend for lying to me. Um, much love everybody. I'll see you in the next one. Hugs and kisses. Bye-bye.